it is beyond a pleasure and an honor. I'm so I just can't tell you how touched I had to be talking to my idol, my mentor, everybody's idol in Miller, Carl Mish. How are you doing, Carl? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I get up every morning and so far, and it really has made me appreciate this last year step by step rather than taking it for granted. We probably all take our life for granted, don't we? Yep, yep. That's, certainly I was. So, so tell us about your journey. Where, where are you at right now? What, what are you doing every day? Um, working on my sixth book, just <laughs> finishing it up. So there's a book that I'm doing with Randy Resnick on complications. And um, we're just about done with that. And that's, I guess that's primarily <laughs> fills my day up. Um, I'm no longer working, seeing patients. So that, that's freed up quite a bit of time. Um, I've lost my three-dimensional adaptability on my left hand, left side of my body, so I'm not able to practice at this point. But I've got great memory, and my lectures are going real well, and the Institute is strong, and, and so I'm counting my blessings. Well, I'm, just in case, you know, um, since this is downloaded uh, on every country on iTunes, uh, there there possibly could be one person listening that doesn't know the man. So I'm going to read your bio, bio. Dr. Carl E. Mish is clinical professor in the Department of Periodontology and Oral Implantology and director of Oral Implantology in the School of Dentistry, Temple University, Philadelphia, in the U.S., Dr. Mish served on the Board of Trustees at the University of Detroit Mercy, where he is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Prosthodontics. He is adjunct professor at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry in the Department of Periodontics, Geriatrics, and adjunct professor at the, at the School of Engineering in the Department of Biomechanics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He was director of the oral implantology residency program at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine from 89 to 96. Dr. Mish has maintained a private practice restricted to implant surgery, bone grafting, and implant placement and related prosthetics for more than 30 years. He previously practiced Beverly Hills, Michigan. Dr. Mish graduated magnum cum laude in 1973 from the University of Detroit Dental School, then went on to receive his prosthodontic certificate, implantology certificate, and master's degree in dental science from the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Yepetid in Istanbul. Yepeti, what is it? Yepeti? Yeah, yeah. In Istanbul, Turkey, and Carol de Villa University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Bucharest, Romania. Each awarded Dr. Miss a PhD. He holds several other postgraduate honors, including 12 fellowships in dentistry including the American College of Dentists, International College of Dentists, Royal Society of Medicine, American Association of Hospital Dentistry, and the Academy of Dentistry Implants. Dr. Mish holds diplomat status at the American Board of Oral Implantology, Implant Dentistry, and served as board president and member of the examining committee. He has also served as president of several implant organizations, including the International Congress of Oral Implantologists, American Academy of Implant Dentistry, Academy of Implants and Transplants and the American College of Oral Implantologists. He is currently co-chairman of the Board of Directors of International Congress of Oral Implantologists, which has more than 90 countries represented and is the world's largest implant organization. In 1984, Dr. Carl Mish founded the Mish International Implant Institute, a one-year continuum for implant education. That's where I met you. I got my fellowship there. The Mish International Implant Institute, which now has locations in Florida and Nevada, over the years, um, MIII has been present in Brazil, Canada, France, Italy, Japan, Korea, Monaco, Spain, and the United Kingdom. This program has or is currently the primary implant education forum for six dental school specialty residencies. As director, he has trained more than 4,500 doctors in a hands-on yearly form of education in implant dentistry. Programs are offered in both the surgical and prosthetic aspects of care. Dr. Mish has more than 10 patents related to implant dentistry and is co-inventor of the BioHorizon Maestro dental implant system. Dr. Mish has written three editions of Contemporary Implant Dentistry, which has become the most popular book in dentistry and has been translated into nine languages, including Japanese, Spanish, Spanish Portuguese, Turkish, Italian, and Korean. He has also written Dental Implant Prosthetics, 
He has published over 250 articles and has repeatedly lectured in every state of the United States as well as in 47 countries throughout the world. Carl, is there anything you haven't done? Well, there's, I don't have much on my list anymore. But uh, And you were also a swimmer. I was at one point. Or a di- were you a swimmer, swimmer or a diver? I was a di- more of a diver. I was on the swim team as a diver. So I, I, I swam the butterfly and I would not win, but um, I was a diver and I took first in every competition I ever had in diving. So at one point, my coach wanted me to try out for the Olympics, but I was too much involved in baseball. And that's a summer sport along with diving and at that point in my career. And so I elected not to do that. I got to tell you, my first my first meeting of you, I uh, live here in Phoenix, and I uh, flew all the way to Pittsburgh. I think it was a seven, three-day weekend continuum, and right. I, I went there on the first day, and I, I think I think I was, I don't know, 24, 25, 26. I forgot how young I was. I was in my 20s. And yeah, you, I, sat, you sat two, do- two rows back on my right-hand side. Um, the first day, the second day, all of a sudden, you were right in the center, right in the first row, and such a face of enthusiasm compared from the second day to the first day. I remember you coming up to me saying, you know, I've learned more in the last two days than I did in all of dental school. Oh, Every yeah. dentist should take this program, and how excited you were about it, and um, yeah, I, I remember that first program that you were at. Oh, oh, thanks. And and I'm telling you, I, I told everybody it was like you just saw Beethoven play, play the piano. I watched you do surgeries all, you know, all throughout that curriculum. And you would do these surgeries. And what blew my mind the most is how you would be doing the surgeries while you were looking up at dentists, talking to them. I mean, you're, you're, it was like it was like Beethoven playing like Stevie Wonder. That's really what you were. You were Stevie Wonder playing the piano. Because half the time you weren't even looking down. You just were just flow. I mean, I've never seen so many implants placed so seamlessly, so easily. So I mean, it was just, it was mind-blowing. Well, and it I- very much is like somebody playing the piano in that you can't learn how to play the piano by watching somebody play the piano. And you have to practice the piano. And it's the same in implant dentistry. You can't learn implant dentistry by watching somebody do surgery. You can definitely learn it by having somebody sit next to you and just like teaching how to play the piano and you practice for eight hours a day for 30 years, you get really good at it. So Carl, you um, you started first though in removable. That, that's where you cut your teeth, wouldn't you say? That prosthodontics? Well, in those days, um, the primary patients that would be sent to me were completely edentulous patients because people were were still doing three inner bridges. And so the primary way to replace a tooth was with a three inner bridge. So that the community that would send me patients since I had an implant restricted practice, as far as I understand, probably the first one in the country, they would send me cases that traditional dentistry had trouble fulfilling. For example, a single tooth implant for a central incisor. Many patients would tell their general dentist, I don't want a bridge. I've never seen a good looking bridge. And they'd say, okay, Mish, here's an implant and a lower denture. They're having trouble with their lower denture. There wasn't anything in traditional dentistry that would solve the problem of a lower denture. And so they say, go see that Mish. And in some circles at that era, I was the crazy guy from Dearborn that was putting titanium in people's jaws and Who knows where this would lead in the future. Maybe it'll end up giving cancer to all these patients. And there was quite a bit of discussion about the bacteria, what happens at the implant sulcus, does it directly go in the bloodstream, and are you putting your patients at risk? And all of the institutions of dentistry were telling their students, stay away from implants. And then all of a sudden, by 1985, Nobel Pharma had enough money to come in with marketing to the dental schools and started with oral surgery programs. And almost overnight, everybody started talking about and referring patients for dental implants. Unfortunately, the dental school faculty had no experience in it, had no knowledge in it. 
And as a consequence, the field was taught by things that were perceived as what is easier, what is faster, what is simpler. And like any discipline, usually the things that are simpler or easier or faster do not correspond directly with what is the best method to do something or what lasts the longest or what has the fewest complications. Rarely are those on the same page. And the thing that the Institute did very early on, realizing there was no science, there were very few clinical studies, is I had a mission statement to help set and elevate the standard of care in implant dentistry. And, and everything taught within my institute would be science-based clinical studies and reformatted implant education at large. And then we had this hands-on program also um, so that my faculty could sit there next to the participant and do the surgeries with them. And that was the first hands-on program in dentistry. We had no hands-on program in restorative. We had no hands-on program in endo. There was no hands-on program in dentistry other than dental school. But once you graduated, you were on your own. You'd go watch somebody talk about a subject for half hour to a day and come back and you're an expert. And implant dentistry is a different field than that. And then unfortunately today, the still, the the driving treatment planning concepts often is what is faster, easier, simpler, and cheaper. And those things still is the driving force in our field. And it is not the most predictable aspects of it. I rewrote the mission statement a couple years ago for the Institute to have that rather than what is faster, easier, simpler, looking at what is most predictable. And within that concept then, it evolves into what is taught from the program at large. Sorry, I have a tendency to ramble. I love your rambling. And, and but Carl, there's a, you know, when anybody emails me for these podcasts, I mean, we, we've, um, they're they're usually usually under thirty. I mean, so all all the data I have on who's going to be listening to this, it's going to be several thousand dentists, and they're mostly going to be young. I want you to take them back because a lot of a lot of these guys forget. You know, when I was in dental school, the there was one guy that started to place implants, and all the other faculty at the University of Missouri Kansas City called him the quack, the butcher. Um, when I opened up my practice, there was a guy across the street that was placed an implant and it would, and, and a lot of these states crucified a lot of these dentists, a lot of these dentists were doing these cases and the first time one failed, they took their license away. Uh, I mean, I mean, those were tough it's pioneering true. days. Isn't that true? Yeah. The, the handful of us that were doing implants on a regular basis were put up in front of the board. Um, it's amazing that we continue through the process. You know, guys like Lin Kao and Ken Judy and Jack Han. Um, yeah, there was a, the dentistry at large was against implant dentistry until the staple implant, which could only be done by oral surgeons, opened up the door because then all of a sudden oral surgeons accepted implants because only the oral surgeon could do this extra oral approach and putting the implant through the chin. Within that, the Branamark system came in and would only sell implants to the oral surgery community. So again, the oral surgeons of the country started saying, yeah, implants are a good thing. And by the way, we're the only ones that can place them. And so they used it primarily as a way to promote their practices. Once the universities got through that system, the periodontist went to Nobel and organized dentistry and said, we're a surgical specialty too. We should be able to do, do this. And most recently, prosthetics has changed its definition. And so now they're doing implant surgery. So that although organized dentistry kept implants out of the private practitioner office, it was the private practitioners that developed it. It was the private practitioners that developed most of the implants that are on the market were designed by private practitioners. 
the vast majority of implants placed in the United States were by private practitioners, but the university-based education would tell graduating dentists stay away from it. And as a concept then, even today, when people enter the field, they're looking for something that is easiest to do. It's perceived, for example, that a central incisor veneer is probably the treatment of choice today because every time you get a great one, they put it on the front of, of dentistry today and dentistry at large has gotten used to looking at you're going to fix a central incisor. The best way to do that to change the color and or size or shape would be a veneer. But people that do this for a living know that of all the teeth in the mouth, that's probably one of the hardest ones to get the color right and the shades right and the value right and all the rest of it. That it, there's a lot of easier teeth to, to restore in the mouth than a central incisor. But the same thing happens in implant dentistry. Most of my patients were central incisors because the patient didn't want to bridge. And it took me years to figure out that they were absolutely right. They would say, I've never seen a good looking bridge to replace that incisor, I don't want to bridge. And they're absolutely right. They've never seen a good one because the good fixed prosthesis you don't see and you're not aware that it's a three and a bridge. You only see the bad ones. And every time you see one, you say, see, I've never seen a good one. And you emphasize to yourself, I'm not gonna get a bridge. And the same thing was happening with implants. If there was ever a problem, almost the whole school would be brought in to see the mobile implant or exit aid coming from an implant site. And I used to tell them, look, you don't judge teeth that way. If a tooth has a periodontal defect, that doesn't mean all teeth don't work. Um, why are you evaluating an implant different than a tooth at that point? And indeed, there are reasons to look at it differently. But the concept is that don't, you know, your preconceived opinion acts as a screen for the information that comes in. It's the reason why Democrats and Republicans go to the same person they hear, let's say Trump, and one walks out and says, that's why I'm a Democrat. The other guy walks out and says, that's why I'm a Republican. They hear the same thing, but they hear it through a different screen. And in that era, in the 70s, the screen was implants are dangerous, implants don't work, stay away from them, and anything that got through the screen would only support that preconceived idea of organized dentistry. I remember. I want to. I want to stay back historical for just a little bit. I remember. Um, I remember one of my friends um, in my in Phoenix did a sinus lift, and an ear, nose, and throat saw it later and reported to the board. And just him doing a sinus lift in '87. I mean, it, it, it was like it was like the the Catholic Church and back in the uh, the Inquisition. Yeah. And, and I remember the ear, nose, and throat guy. I mean, I I even remember his name. I probably shouldn't say it. And he would just going on about this is the absolute craziest thing he's ever heard of in his entire life and and anybody who does that should have their license taken away what would what, what was well, what, then, then flash forward 30 years i and your hospital right across the street from pittsburgh had me train all their ent residents in how to do a sinus graph because they figured this may be a way to treat some conditions of sinusitis that's chronic and so here we go again, we go from one thing saying it's outside the standard of care, flash forward, well, let's start teaching all our residents how to do this procedure. So so how um so whatever happened to subperiosteals, ramus frames, talk about talk about how talk about the things that came and gone. Because now you're writing are you working on your fourth edition of the book or would you say what edition? Uh complications. It's a it's a new book. So that the uh, surgical edition has uh, several editions. The prosthetic book has a couple of editions, and then there's a the new book that'll be coming out is primarily complications and the treatment thereof. So, so um um, talk talk about the things that came and gone like ramus frames and subperiosteals because in a way, isn't the um, you always who's doing the most advertising on television in my area, Phoenix, is that uh, all on four. 
And it kind of reminds me of Ramus frame because they're not really an alveolar bone. They're going straight back into, you know. Yeah, it's true. And it, it, the all on four concept is perfect for the environment of which implant dentistry is being taught. What is fastest, easiest, cheapest? Well, all on one was attempted for a very short time. It didn't work. All on two. What was, what was all on one? Well, they had this guy in Europe that thought he could put one implant in and hang 12 teeth on it. And it I've never even heard of that. Is that, oh, is that yeah, right? Yeah. I've got a couple pictures of his cases, you know, and it, it, he literally got booed off the stage. But there was all on three for quite a while in Europe. And there were nine different countries that at their major meetings would show all on three. Again, it didn't last very long. All on three means, you know, none on two, basically. You lost an implant, you lost everything associated with it. And the all on four concept certainly can be used in selective cases, but the threshold of problems is risky. What many people forget is that these restorations, especially on the, on the all on four type, are screw retained. And abutment screw loosening or prosthetic screw loosening is a very common complication. You're putting three implants in to try to get the triangular, like a tripod for support. But if one abutment screw gets loose, not an implant failure, if one abutment screw gets loose, Worse yet, if one prosthetic screw gets loose, and if you look at these prosthetic screws, they're only one and a half millimeters in diameter, they have seven threads, and if one of those prosthetic screws break or get loose, which occurs more than 28% of the time, now it's all on two, and all on two blows out one or two of the implants. And so you've got this $10,000 treatment, some people are charging as much as 20,000, all based on a metal component one and a half millimeters in diameter and seven threads touching metal and it doesn't make sense it's you know it doesn't make sense to, to balance a treatment plan so perfectly that if one thing happens the whole case breaks down faster easier cheaper usually is not the best thing to do it's better to have something back up so if you have a complication, it doesn't automatically lead to a catastrophic, catastrophic failure. A couple years ago, I opened up a practice in Chicago, an implant complication practice. My thought in the beginning was treating complications takes more experience, doesn't have as high a success rate, and as a consequence, the profession needs a vehicle to treat complications and, and so I developed this practice thinking that you know it was something unique and I was never so busy in all my life. I, all these problems start flooding the gates in Chicago, many of them all on four because all on four was coming into a treatment center in Chicago. Since then they've had three different surgeons, they've had four different restoring teams, they come, they go because they give the impression to the patient that this can be a lifetime device and if it doesn't last a lifetime all of a sudden the practitioner is forced to do it again for nothing and they don't know how to treat it again because the second time is worse than the first time there's usually less bone there's more of a complication associated with it it doesn't make sense to balance your mission statement and whether you're aware of it or not when you're in private practice you have a mission statement the way that your practice primarily runs is based on some underlying theme that you may be aware of or not. And no matter what practice development course you take, they tell you very early on and to go into a mission statement. If you take any patient that walks in the door, primarily your new patients are emergency patients, well, that's your, emergent, that's your mission statement. We're here to handle emergencies. If you broke a filling or have a, have a hot tube, come see us. We're always open. Your mission statement may be, we're cheaper than anybody else. You know, we'll do two for one. We won't accept the copay. Your mission statement is, we're cheap. And so let everybody know that we're cheap. Well, it seems to me that my newest mission statement within my practice when I opened it in Chicago 
was I wanted to develop a practice of which I could maintain your teeth and our implants in health for the rest of your life. That's a mission statement that can be done with modern dentistry. And if you look at then the primary reasons why people lose teeth, that's where the practice focuses on. So if plaque is a problem where people could lose teeth, well, then you've got to develop a hygiene aspect to the practice. And you let the patients know we need to see you periodically because decay can be a major reason you lose teeth. Gum disease, plaque related. We need to see you every three to six months because gum disease is a major cause of loss of teeth. And our mission statement is to maintain your teeth the rest of your life, which we're able to do in modern dentistry. You lose a tooth. My goal is to return the patient to normal contour, comfort, function, aesthetic, speech, and health. That's my mission statement for replacing teeth. That mission statement turns out that the best way to replace the tooth for longevity would be with an implant. Once the implant's in place, the mission statement transforms to, I want that implant to be maintained in health for the rest of the patient's life. And within those overwhelmingly conscious choices you make as a practitioner, you run your practice. And all of a sudden, in your waiting room, you've got your mission statement to maintain your teeth and or implants for the rest of your life in health. And when a patient has decay, well, I've got to fix the decay because I'll run the risk that I won't be able to maintain your tooth in health for the rest of your life. You need endo. Okay, we're going to do endo because I want to maintain that tooth for the rest of your life in health. You need to replace a tooth. I want an implant because it will help me maintain the rest of your teeth with highest predictability. It goes back over and over again to your mission statement, what you do for every service you render within your practice. And it gives the patient a reason why they should show up every three to four months because the bacteria change. It gives them a, a reason why pocket depths greater than five millimeters increase the risk of anaerobic bacteria. So that pocket, pocket probing, sulcus probing is part of the practice and monitoring of that and taking care of conditions that start getting deeper. And it, and it underlies all the decision-making aspect within your practice and for your patients. So whether you know it or not, your practice is run by these mission statements. I'll change the subject. I like <clears throat> this is um, you know, th these dentists listen to you that they're individuals, and they they go to a dental conference because they they want to start getting into implants, and they see literally two hundred and seventy five different people selling a titanium implant. My question to you is. <clears throat> What should these individual dentists be thinking about when they're trying to um, invest in an implant system? You know, there's, some of them are, um, their mission statement is we're the cheapest. Some of them are very expensive. Some are in the middle. What, what, what should a dentist be thinking when they're um, going to pick a system? And, well, and can, they, can they just pick one system? Or when you look at it, do you really need a couple of systems to do everything that you need to do? It depends on your training, your experience level. Certainly an experienced practitioner can use one system for most everything they do within their own practice. However, they probably shouldn't treat every patient that comes in the door. There are some patients that should be referred regardless of who you are. Um, very few dentists, oral surgeon or not, are familiar with iliac crest grafts and implants and edentulous maxillae. Um, Perhaps that's not the type of patient that you should challenge, especially in the beginning, or a question even at the end. So all of us need to refer somebody. You, you do a filling on a patient, they get endocarditis. There's not too many dentists that would do the flap replacement. Although when I first got out of dental school, I thought if I saw the lecture on it, I'd be able to do it. Boy, if one of my early patients got endocarditis, I'd probably admit them and do the do the flap replacement myself. But as I've matured, I've realized there are some cases that regardless of your training, you should refer to somebody else. If they have a problem, they're less likely to have an opportunity to have a litigious action against you. And so use other practitioners around you for their expertise, whether it's ENT or oral surgery or Cancer, you know, send it to an oral surgeon that treats cancer. Don't send it to an oral surgeon that the only cancer they saw was in their residency. 
you know, fly them down to go see Marx. There, there are certain individuals that have expertise in certain aspects of treatment that we don't see on a regular basis as a general practitioner and therefore have the guts to be able to send a patient out. It doesn't mean you're inferior. It doesn't mean they're better than you. Every physician knows they treat a patient with a team approach. Every surgeon I'm aware of at every hospital, before they do surgery, they have to send the patient to an internist who then does a medical review of the patient in internal medicine and clears them for surgery. They're a world-renowned heart transplant surgeon, but to do surgery, they got to send it to the internist department at the hospital before they can do their surgery. And a dentist should be aware, it's, it does, it's not something against you if you get a second opinion or if you refer a patient for one aspect of care. You don't have to do everything for the patient if you put the patient first rather than your ego first. And who is he, it? And who were you talking to? Marks? What's his first name and where is he at? Marks is in Florida. He probably treats more cancer patients than anybody else. Um, does a, a great job at Miami, and that whole department is set up to primarily treat cancer, oral cancer. What's his patients. first name? Bob Marks. Bob Mark M A R X. M A R X. M A R X. Yeah, University of Miami. So, so back to, um, can you recommend any implant systems, or would you rather remain agnostic? Well, I, I, the most important thing is not the system; it's the treatment plan. You can have the best system possible, but if you have a stupid treatment plan, it's not going to work. Like I, that one implant replacing 14 teeth. I don't, it's not the system that's going to make that treatment plan work. You know, so the most important thing is the treatment plan. And if you notice the programs that when you go through the Institute, the vast majority of time isn't talking about the rotation of the burr and what the RPM should be, although we've done studies on it and the heat that's generated and all the rest of that aspects of it, we spend more time talking about where the implant should be positioned, how many implants should be used, what is the quality of bone related to determining the implant number, so that the treatment plan is the most important aspect of the care. And what makes it last predictably long-term is more related to the treatment plan, the angulation the implant's placed, the position the implant's placed, the size of the implant. If I look at my evolution, talking about treatment planning, we used to talk about implant design rather early in a lecture series and talking about the difference of a press fit implant and a threaded implant and surface area because stress equals force over area. But as it's evolved and the studies have evolved, the implant design is number nine on the list as far as importance now. Much more important are, for example, things that people often ignore, patient stress factors, for example. If stress is the major reason for complications, and it is biomechanical stress, then we look at what is a biomechanical set stress in this particular patient and under these particular conditions. Are, are they a bruxer? Are they a clencher? What is the quality of the bone to be able to handle the stress that's going to be applied to it? And if you then you, you apply all these factors, you're looking at it. When an engineer designs something, they look at where is it most likely to fail. And then they start designing things that make that not the most likely place to fail. So that if you know, for example, that the most common reason this prosthesis has a problem is the abutment screws get loose. You look at the nine things that contribute to abutment screw loosening, and implant diameter is a major one. The platform size is a major one. Uh, the torque you put on the screw is a major one. So you start looking at where does where do these systems fail? Now we're going to build up a stop against those most common failure systems, and then I'll have less complications. And the reason why. The people that go through the institute have the highest success rate and the fewest complications, much fewer than the literature averages, is because the decisions that are based within the institute are science-based, 
not what is the easiest thing. What is the, the easiest thing? One implant. I go back to the one implant. One implant has been used. There are some pretty good studies showing sure, one, one implant in the synthesis for an overdenture is equivalent to two implants. When I see two implants, I've got a hour and a half lecture on complications related to the two implant overdenture. It's the most common thing done. It's most common thing done because it's simple and it's less cost. But even simpler is one implant in the midline. And there's a number, number of studies now that's showing one implant in the midline is probably better than two implants. Two implants have more complications than one implant. So if we look at where are the complications coming from and then what is the cause of the complications, then you can build treatment plans or concepts that reduce the complications and increase the success rates. And it rarely is related to faster, easier, simpler. A very common question with a single implant placed with a single crown is, do you cement that or screw it? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I wrote an article years ago, and I, it isn't much different today. I've got 17 reasons why a cemented crown has an advantage over a screw-retained crown. If I look at that article, it was primarily where multiple implants were being joined together. And if multiple implants are being joined together, it is almost impossible to screw retain the prostheses and have it pa passive. The metal-metal connection in implant prosthetics means you can have zero tolerance for air in fabrication of the prostheses. And zero tolerance of air is impossible in multiple unit prostheses. All impression materials shrink, all stone expands, metal constricts when, it, when it's cast, when it's machined, it, it, what is the quality of the impression that you're taking? It is a, a digital impression or is it a conventional impression? Analog variants, the analogs in implant dentistry are not exactly the same as the implant components that they represent. And there's so many variances that it's kind of like the joke with somebody applying for a job and the interviewer says, okay, I've got three people here. I'm going to ask you all the same question. The first one is a teacher and the interviewer says, what's two plus two? And the teacher says, two plus two is four, always was, always will be four. The next one is a engineer. He says, what's two plus two? And the engineer says, well, it's between 3.9999 and 4.001. <laughs> And then the next one is an attorney. And he says, what's two plus two? And he says, what do you want it to be? <laughs> and, and in engineering, there's enough variance that you can't have absolute values. And therefore, when you're splinting things together using a screw, you get variance of fit. And a 20 Newton centimeter force on a screw is enough mechanical force to move two railroad cars if they're on level ground. And literally, when the screws are applied, the implants move in the bone with immediate load of quite a bit of result, and it increases crestal bone loss, it increases the risk risk early implant failure, and it increases the risk of screw loosening later during prosthesis function. So if I look at, a major advantage of multiple implants being splinted together when they're cement retained is you have a cement space. And as a consequence, it's much easier to get a passive casting. And as a consequence, cement in many cases is a better alternative. However, if you put the margin of the crown down near the level of the bone and you leave residual cement, it comes back with periimplantitis. So the most popular cement that's used in implants grows anaerobic bacteria. The most popular cement that's used in dental implants is radiolucent. You don't see it on a post-op x-ray. The most popular cement, if I was the devil and I wanted to screw dentistry and I say, I'm going to tell you to use this cement because it will hurt more patients than anybody else, that's the number one, two, and three cement that's used in the United States. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But because of the lack of training and understanding, we end up using products that actually put us at a higher risk 
then at a better benefit. And it's not related to the manufacturer. Well, it can. Several of these manufacturers sell their own cement, and their own cement is radiolucent and grows anaerobic bacteria, and they put the name Implant Cement on it, and they don't make it themselves. They get it from Europe, and then they put their name on it, so it's another money vehicle for them, and yet it's a cement that should never be used in implant dentistry. We need more science. We need more studies. We need less how do I play the piano with no lessons and never practicing? That's basically what we're doing in implant dentistry. And then our teachers have never played the piano and they take a one day course and they come back and they regurgitate what they heard from some guy that said it before. Or lately they take my book. My book is now the number one book in the history of dentistry. <laughs> my, my implant books have sold more books than any other book in dentistry. Why? Because nobody has any training. And at least now the instructors are buying my book and reading the chapter and then giving a lecture instead of literally just going to a lecture for an hour and trying to regurgitate the jokes. It's, um, if you're not using implants on a regular basis within your treatment planning, within your private practice, the world has passed you by. But to get that training, you, it doesn't come through the air. And indeed, it is a, a treatment planning skill based on science and clinical studies, and it is a hands-on approach. You can't learn dentistry without hands-on. Italy opened up its first dental school in the late 90s. To be a dentist in Italy, you went to medical school, and then you came out and you practiced for a few weeks with somebody that did, did dentistry in their private office, and you'd assist them for a couple weeks, and then you're qualified to be a dentist in Italy. It didn't work well. It didn't work well for the country. So they finally opened up their own dental schools. There was a lot of politics against it because the physicians didn't want to go back to school or they didn't want to go to school longer, but they found that you need to do some hands-on approach. Prior to the 90s, you were a dentist, you've never given an injection, you've never cut a tooth, you've never did a prophylaxis on a patient, but you practice dentistry. Well, that's the way we are in implant dentistry now. The teachers in the universities, six universities now use my institute to train their oral surgery residents or perio residents or prosthetic residents because they've realized their teachers don't have the experience and the knowledge and the training to be able to teach this to a specialty resident, especially at a specialty level. And it's cheaper for them to send their residents to the Mish Institute, get the didactic training, have my faculty go in their dental school and supervise their surgeries, and that it's more effective and cheaper, cheaper for them to have the Institute train their oral surgery residents or perio residents than it is for them to develop their own faculty. The general dentists that are taking the program at the Institute, they're getting the same lectures and the same training as the oral surgery programs or the perio programs that are using the Institute for that same purpose. And that's at, and they can find it, that at mish.com, which is M-I-S-C-H.com. What cities are those in? Will you talk about that? And how many, um, how many different, um, sessions and programs do you have at your what cities are they having and how many well, sessions do you have you know, over the years it's evolved into different um selections let's, let's i guess yeah, for years the primary place this was was michigan because that's where my private practice was and then it evolved into pittsburgh because i had an implant residency there and then it evolved into temple because i had an implant residency there and so now, now we, we're currently doing the program in Miami, in Las Vegas, and in California, in LA. But um, it changes from year to year. It depends on where the greatest need seems to be for the following year. And so my, the person that's helped me run the Institute, uh, is her name is Heidi Cartagena. And she's been with me for 20-some years. I did implants for her maxillary cuspids when she was... 15 years old, and that was about 30 years ago. She's been with me ever since. 
And so if you were going to say, okay, I want to take the program as soon as possible, where is it going to be? Well, I guess Vegas. But this, there's a program in California, L.A., relatively soon after that. And it's broken up into these Friday, Saturday, Sunday sessions. And each session concentrates on a different region of the mouth. So there's one session that concentrates on the anterior maxilla. There's another one that concentrates on the anterior mandible. There's one that concentrates on the posterior maxilla and the sinus grafting procedures. And so each program concentrates on a different anatomic location, on a different prosthesis type for that particular patient type. And then there are laboratory set up so that my faculty and, and you go through these hands-on programs on Sunday. And so, you know, we, we've trained one out of every 20 dentists in Canada has gone through the Institute. We've got tens of thousands of doctors we've trained from 47 countries and every state in the United States for now over 30 years so that the faculty and I have lots of experience at the level that you enter, whatever level it is, and I don't care. Mike Picos has been through my program five times. He's got a great program, but he comes through the program because the program is always changing. It's updating. There's clinical studies that are added to it. And don't get fooled by people say, well, don't take Mish now. Take my program first because his program is so advanced. Take my program so that you learn you know, the, the beginning of implant dentistry and then go take his program afterwards. Those guys were trained by me. They were sitting in the same seat that you're sitting in now. You might as well take it from the persons that wrote the book rather than somebody that reads the chapter and attempts to give a lecture outside the book. So I would suggest you get involved soon and that you come to the original source. There's got to be a reason why my book is the number one book in the history of dentistry. But it's based on science, organized studies. Two, two things on your book. <clears throat> I'd, wouldn't you recommend they read that before they go to your course? Yeah, the, their, the course simulates several chapters in the book. And so before you come, I tell you which chapters in the book will be discussed at that particular program. For example, the book has 440 pictures in it. Each weekend, we go through more than 4,500 slides. And so it almost becomes like a movie picture. You're seeing so many pictures of the topics that we're, we've selected to talk about that particular weekend. So if I look at the best way to get the information is to, number one, treat. For example, if you decide to take it this year, treat this year as if you were signed up for a full-time implant residency. I didn't understand when I was a general dentist why a prosthodontist that does literally six to ten cases in their prosthetic program of two years would be better off than a guy in general practice like me that did a full mouth rehab every week. I did 20, 30 of these things every year. They're doing six in their whole residency. Why are they a specialist and I'm not? Well, what I, what I realized when I went back to get my specialty is that you spend that year or two years thinking about that subject 24-7. You're talking to your friends, your other residents 24-7. You have a literature review of it. You're reading about the different topics 24-7. You have supervised surgical training so that when you're doing the procedure, they're sitting right next to you and they're saying, no, put your hand like this or use this instrument next. And, and by the end of the two years, you didn't do one case 50 times, indeed you did 50 cases, and each one was different. And that's the difference between a residency and being in general practice, of which you're doing more, but you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Nobody's challenging you. You're not taking pictures and blowing up so the teeth are 300 times the size so you can see every problem that's associated with the treatment that you did. And it's a completely different environment between a hands-on supervised training or sitting in a class and looking at some slides. I would suggest that you come to the program. You spend this year as if it was a residency. I'm going to read articles. I'm going to read the chapter. I'm going to read the book. I'm going to 
After I hear the lecture, go back home, read the chapter again, take pictures of my cases, bring the pictures, send the pictures to the Mish faculty, have the faculty comment on the pictures and comment on what you could do a little di different, meaning what you should do a little bit different, and use this year then as a learning curve. And this, if you do that for one year, you'll never have to go back again. It's just like you never go back to dental school again. You studied pharmacology deep enough. You studied histology deep enough. You studied whatever clinical sciences deep enough that you don't have to go back to dental school. You can take programs that accelerate your, your learning in one area or not, but you don't have to start from scratch if, because you spent a lot of time and effort the first time around. You go through the institute, you train it like it's a implant residency, you'll never have to go through the program Again, you'll have to go back to see updates. You'll have to go back to see why all on four can be used in some situations and why it shouldn't be used in others because that's a more relatively new concept. You, you'll go through other aspects of when do I do this particular thing and why we shouldn't do this anymore with our more of the studies that we've done. And it, it is something that if you're going to wear the title of doctor, most everybody from the time of G.B. Black that says you have no other right than to be a continuous student. We say it, but we sometimes forget it. We have a tendency to been there before, gonna practice next year the same as I did the last five years. And the practice sells more dentistry when it's cheaper and you evolve into what's cheapest, what's easiest, what's fastest. And all of a sudden, after 15 years, you go to me and you say, I hate my practice. I, the patients, I'm having problems. They expect me to do these cases over again. I'm fighting with the staff on a regular basis because I can't pay my overhead. And it's because you created your own demon. The way that you set up your practice and the way you practice on a daily basis is the, what's going to follow you until you decide to retire. And if you set it up one way, you're going to have a great end of your career. And if you set it up someplace else, you're going to hate dentistry. And I constantly get people that come through the Institute that says, you know, I practiced dentistry for 45 years. I hate it. The one thing that I like about the Institute is now I love dentistry again. I can see what I should be doing, not what I can do, but what I should do. And there's a big difference. You know, can you rob a bank for a living? Sure. <laughs> but you shouldn't. You know, can I steal that piece of gum when I'm checking out at the grocery store? Yeah, it's right there. You'll get away with it all the time. But the one day you get caught, you'll get embarrassed, have to go down to jail, have to file a report, do all that shit. Don't steal the gum. And so the Institute will show you the ways that are most predictable to get to the end of treatment so that the patient's care will last them the rest of their life. And that is the mission statement for your practice and for the Institute to teach you that. Well, Carl, you know how you talk about faster, easier, better, and cheapest isn't always the most predictable. Do you think there's too many immediate loaded implants being done today? Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, it's a fashion topic. You know, what happens in dentistry is you get these implant dentistry is no different. You get these, fashion topics. and fashion, what is the new color this year? Are the skirts high? Are the skirts low? Nobody's going to go hear a lecture talking about the RPM of a drill and make <laughs> a two implant overdenture. <laughs> you know, of course, things that we've been talking about for 30 years. There's going to be nobody in the lecture hall for that. And nobody's going to get in a plane to go across the country to learn about a two implant overdenture, although they probably should take mine because I'll show you the 28 things that you're doing wrong more often than not. But in order to, to, to be popular, you need to have a subject that wasn't discussed before. And so the fashionable color at the present time is immediate load over the last five years. And so the concept that was tried and tested was submerged healing, making sure integration was complete, 
fix the problem prior to making the prostheses if any bone loss exists, et cetera, and then go ahead with making the prostheses. Tested, time tested. Immediate load, compressing all this together became fashionable because it was different and because it was faster, you'd collected your money earlier. Well, if you're doing implant dentistry primarily for the money, which unfortunately a lot of people are, including the people that are giving the lecture, the most predictable way to make money in implant dentistry is to schedule a long surgery appointment in your office with sedation. That means the patient is gonna be in your office for several hours, and because it's with sedation, they have to bring somebody from their house to get them there and to take them home. Now you have two people out of their house. Then you schedule the appointment, you know where they're gonna be for the next couple hours along with their ride, and you go to their house and rob them. Nobody's gonna be home, very predictable. You'll be able to rob them, you won't get caught. You'll be able to sell their shit at the pawn store. That's a very predictable way to make money. I'm not suggesting you do that, but if you're doing it for the money, that's basically what you're doing. You're robbing from the patient and you're just doing it because, what? Because the patient says yes. The thing that protected many patients early on in somebody's early learning curve in surgery is that the fee is so high, most patients say no, so they hurt less, fewer patients. I can't tell you how many doctors have been through the Institute and said, God, I wish I'd taken this course three years ago. I've treated 50 patients the wrong way. I'm seeing these complications. I didn't know why I was having all these complications. For example, the two implant overdenture. The two implant overdenture the average post-operative complications are four to six that take six to 10 post-operative appointments. That's multiple studies. Now, if you're gonna have a prosthesis and a treatment plan of which you're gonna spend four to six appointments fixing complications, it's not cheaper what you're doing. Every time you see a patient for a post-op complication for a two-implant overdenture, you lose $150. By the time you schedule an appointment, clean up the room, talk to the patient, how's your friends, how's your family? Oh, you're having a problem with retention. Okay, let me see what I can do. You, you change a little ring or an attachment. It costs you 150 bucks. Clean up the room before you see the next patient. They'll show it back in your office two weeks, three weeks later. The average post-op visit, six times they come back to you. After the sixth time you do a reline, the second most common complication is doing a reline because you've changed the attachment three times. Now you're doing a reline. You've lost the whole profits of the case and you've got the next 40 years that this patient's gonna keep bothering you. You set up a nightmare for the practice. Well, it doesn't make sense to sell a case faster, easier, cheaper if it's gonna come back to bite you in the butt four to six times on average and then every few months until that patient dies or goes to somebody else. I mean, it just, it, when you have an implant restricted practice, you learn real quick, 90% sucks in implant dentistry. If you have one out of 10 patients have a problem, that's a terrible practice management issue. I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that you have a much higher success rate, and the success means success of the prosthetic device also, and a much lower complication rate. So I'm going to show you why certain things should be done and why you should stay away from other things. And usually the things that are most popular end up driving a number of patients in your office, but too many of those patients that are coming in the office you're treating for free because it's a complication of which you end up treating for free. Doesn't make sense. You might as well double the fee or send that patient to your busiest competition. Competition. It fills up their office with complaining patients and you have no, more room to see the good ones. Carl, a lot of, uh, a very frequently asked question on Dental Town is, um, some some young dentists just to rule out complications. One thing they get rid of is any smoker. Um, is 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 that is that too harsh on a patient? Because I mean, they're, at the end of the day, they're humans. I mean, if they come in, they don't. You know, we, we're not judgmental. But do you just say if they're just a smoker, 
is it just no or is there like a time period where you say, well, if you quit for two days or six weeks or well, what, what's your thoughts on smoking? What? This is a personal decision within your practice. I did a, a rather large study on 50 consecutive sinus graft patients, and it was theorized that smoking may affect the sinus graft more than other grafts because the smoke can be right there. And so you may have an issue was you may have more complications in smokers than any other type. And so I did, I did in Europe, I had a practice in Monte Carlo for years. And in Europe, they are much less inclined to have litigious action against you. And so I did 50 consecutive cases of sinus graft in smokers. And I didn't find any difference in the smoker than in the non-smoker. There was a slightly higher incidence of, this, of tearing the mucosa during the procedure, but they didn't become infected. All the implants that were placed, which was more than 120, were still there five years later. And so in that particular study, smoking was not relevant to the particular procedure. However, in the United States, every periodontist in their literature review reads papers that show smoking is directly parallel to periodontal disease. They have diagnosis of smoking periodontitis, and they spent a lot of literature review and discussion of smoking and periodontal disease and alteration of bacteria and the other aspects of it. As a consequence, if you're a general dentist and you do an implant on a patient that's a smoker and the implant fails, if that patient becomes litigious because you decide not to do it again for nothing or, or they don't like your breath or whatever the reason they decide to sue you, they will most always be able to find a periodontist that says you shouldn't smoke when you do surgery. And as a consequence, you're apt to lose the litigious case. And therefore, to protect yourself medical legally in the United States, I would tell the patient, don't smoke. It increases your risk of complications and failure as a consequence of this. So I don't want you to smoke with this. And then it's up to your personality whether you're willing to take the risk or not. If smokers had a direct correlation to failure, we would have seen it in Europe a long time ago. I was in Monte Carlo every month. Restaurants over in Europe would have a smoking section and a chain smoking section. <laughs> Everybody smoked. And if I review the literature, the European literature and the American studies, they're very similar. You're very similar in types of complications, percentage of complications. I don't see this high, much higher incidence of complications related to smoking. So I did a study, so I can say I did a study. I didn't see any difference in the two groups. And as a consequence, with my background and experience and level of expertise, I may choose to work on a smoker because I don't consider it a major issue. I'll tell the patient to protect myself medical legally and because I'm a doctor and I'm trying to help the patient's health and my goal is to keep them in health for the rest of their life with their teeth and our implants and smoking increases the risk of decreased health. Therefore, as a doctor, I tell them don't smoke. But if I look out the window and they're sitting in their car smoking before they come in for the surgery, I'll do the surgery. I'll pretend I didn't see them. <laughs> We're not recording this, are we? <laughs> <laughs> because, because in my clinical studies, my observation, I haven't seen a major difference. However, one of the best residents I ever had, he was my associate for two, three years before he became my resident. He was one of my best residents, Craig Mish, my brother, he will not work on a patient that smokes. He says, Carl, the only complication, I don't get that many complications, but if I look at the couple complications I have a year, they're most always smokers. So he's decided within his practice, he's not going to work on any smokers anymore. So he'll put them on a patch, he'll, he'll help them stop smoking, and he doesn't work on them unless they no longer smoke. That's his choice, okay? 
I didn't go to that extreme. So that's why I say it's a personal thing. But I can tell you, if they have a problem and if they sue you, you'll probably lose the case. You'll probably lose the case. If nothing else, patients feel sorry for them that they have to go through the surgery again. And they always bring their wife in saying they can't get oral sex like they used to and all this other BS that the legal system does to us today as, as American dentists. But it's a personal decision. It's just like the CAT scan. You know, do you have to take a CAT scan? No, we did implants for 50 years without a CAT scan. It's obvious you don't have to take a CAT scan to have a successful case. However, if you do something and it fails and the expert says you should have taken a CAT scan, you'll probably lose the case. So I put it in, if you do it without a CAT scan, it's not malpractice. It's not outside the standard of care, but it's stupid because you're going to lose the case if it fails. Same with smoking. It's not outside the standard of care in my practice, but it's stupid. I mean, it, it increases your risk. And so I can partly defend it to the point that maybe I'll win in the court, but it gives another sword on the other side. And unfortunately, these cases now settle for so much money that it becomes a, a particular risk within a private practice. Therefore, don't do something faster, easier, cheaper that's more likely to have a complication that then you have to go back and say, well, you're a smoker. Do something that you're less likely to have a complication so you won't have to deal with that stuff. Carl, we call this uh, Dentistry Uncensored, and I think that's why the show is so popular. Um, I want to ask you uh, probably the most controversial question in plant dentistry. There's a lot of people that say, you buy my $100,000 CBCT, and you mill out a surgical guide, Stevie Wonder could place this in. You just snap in the surgical guide, go right through the hole. And then there's other dentists or implantologists uh, who have placed, you know, thousands of implants to say, I never use a surgical guide. Um, what is your thoughts? What percent of your implants in the last 10 years did you use a surgical guide? Well, if I, if I go to your developmental period as a individual, did you grow up in the area in the era of which you didn't have a CT? For example, guys like Tatum and myself and Han and Linkow, we didn't have CTs back then. I mean, we were arguing, should you take a Panorex? And the people that were against taking a Panorex would say, oh, it, the Panorex will show some pathology from the carotid, and if you don't diagnose this, you'll get sued for it. So don't take a Panorex because it's showing bigger areas, uh, and you're going to be held to a higher standard because you're taking a Panorex instead of a periapical x-ray. And there's a whole discussion of which, 40 years later, there hasn't been one lawsuit against a guy that took a Panorex instead of a PA. It was all bullshit. <laughs> the new aspect says the same thing about the CT. Don't take a CT. It opens up a whole wide area of pathology. And if you miss the diagnosis, the cancer in the sinus, you're held to a higher standard. Enough. It's the same bullshit we had with the Panorex, with the Eric. So we've seen enough cases we i've changed as a director of the institute i've seen enough altered anatomies within the cat scans that are taken with the hundreds of surgeries that i review a year that i now say take a cat scan and if you don't it's not outside the standard of care but you're stupid if something happens you know um and so you're adding an element of risk. So it doesn't seem make sense to me to add an element of risk on an early learning curve. On an early learning curve, don't skip any steps. Don't go to immediate load. Don't go without a CAT scan. Don't, you know, take all the steps. And once you've got 20, 30, 50 surgeries under your belt, then you make a decision patient by patient. In my career, I look at the ridge, and if it, the ridge looks like it's wider than my finger, and I look at a periapical or a panorex, and it looks like there's 30 millimeters of bone in height, I'll open up the ridge without a CAT scan. I'll look at the mental foramen, 
and compare it to where I thought the mental foramen was. And if the mental foramen distance to the crest of the ridge is greater than 12 millimeters, I'll place the implant behind it because I've checked it with the anatomic landmark that I know in the area, compared it on the x-ray, and I've got 40 years of clinical experience. However, this is your first case, and you're all worried about hitting the mandibular canal, which you probably should be. It makes sense to take a CAT scan. Now, my brother and I, because of these hands-on surgical courses, we've seen quite a few dentists come into our hands-on surgical courses that have a CAT scan and a surgical guide. They put the surgical guide in the patient, they drill the holes through the surgical guide, we reflect the tissue because in these hands-on courses we always reflect the tissue prior to closing up the case to check to make sure there's bone completely around the implant, the implant's in the direction you want, and the implant can be restored. And in more than half the cases, when we reflect the facial and the palatal tissue, the implant is out the facial or out the palate. And the reason for that is the burr creeps in soft bone. It creeps away from harder bone. So you drill into a ridge, and if there's hard bone on one side of the osteotomy and softer bone on the other side, which it often is, not homogeneous, the burr creeps away from the hard bone and creeps toward the softer aspect of bone. Even if the osteotomy is correct, when a threaded implant goes in, it hits the harder bone side and it gets pushed, and the implant gets pushed to the softer bone side of the osteotomy. And when the implant goes in, you go, what the shit, it's two, three millimeters more distal than it, than it was when it started out, or it's, the angle is, I, it, I gotta use this angle post to bring it back toward the palate because it's sticking out toward the cheek too much. It, 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 it's not like endo. You know, it, 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 endo seems to have this problem less than an implant drill within bone. And as a consequence, if you are going to use a surgical guide, prior to closing up the case, incise and reflect the tissue. What many will end up doing after they do a handful of these guided surgeries is say, I'm going to reflect the tissue and then use a guided guide after the tissue is reflected to make sure that the drill isn't going out the facial prior to me placing the implant out the facial. And they'll do a modification of a surgical guide and a conventional reflect and, and position placement. Um, very few times have I seen somebody that uses a surgical guide not have the implant in the wrong place at least half the time. At the end of the year, I have the students grade their surgeries. They get a grade for implant position, the depth of the implant, which is hard to determine when you're using a surgical guide, how deep did you place the implant, the angulation of the implant, what's the restoration ability for that, patient management associated with it, suturing of it. So you'll grade five different aspects of your surgery and you'll give yourself a grade of one to 10. At the end of each month, you look at your surgeries and you say, God, this one step, let's say suturing, this one step suturing, I get real high grades, and this other step, I, I, I'm giving myself very low grades. I gotta concentrate more on the ones that I'm getting low grades on. So it allows you to assess what you're doing. Too often in implant surgery, if the surgeon sets up the kit, the implant's gonna go in the mouth, regardless of what happens during the surgery. The implant's going too close to an adjacent tooth or it's going out the facial plate, they keep going. And once the implant's in the mouth, once it gets threaded in, it's there. And it's successful. And success purely in implant dentistry means it's in the mouth, I got it in. And most anybody can get an implant in the mouth once you start the surgery. The bone is soft, the implant spins a little bit, ah, it's in the mouth, I'll just bang on the top or I'll close it up or I'll make the sign of a cross and a star of David and put on my, get my floor mat out and it'll be right. You know, so how do you want to play this game? I chose to play this game at the highest level I know. 
I chose to take the term doctor to the extreme. Not what is easiest, but what if the world was watching me? What should it look like? I chose. If I'm working on the Pope, I'm going to give this patient the same treatment as the Pope because they expect me to do my best. They don't expect me just to collect the money. They expect for that what is the best possible thing that I can do for them at this particular time. And if it's not right, I've got a saying at the Institute, don't compromise the potential 30-year prosthesis for a three-month procedure. The procedure's done, the implant's in the wrong place, take it out, do a socket graft, come back in three months, and next time, keep both eyes open. Don't make the same mistake twice in a row on the same patient. You actually did place an implant on the Pope. Uh, I've treated the Pope, the King of Guitars, several celebrities. Two of my most famous patients died the same week. Prince Rainier and the Pope died the same week. Yeah. And and how many implants do you think you've placed in your four, 40 year career? I don't know. I've had that question <laughs> a few times. I don't know. You know, I'm in excess of 20,000, but I don't know if that's high or low. You know, in the old days, if you placed one, you were the audience, none of the audience had placed an implant. Carl, I want to ask. Today, you place an implant and you start teaching it right away. You know, see one, do one, teach one. That re that's most of the implant lectures I see are guys that have done the procedure a couple times and now they're modifying it. Girl, I want to ask you a question. I, I have a hard time personally understanding. So we're, we're taught by the pediatric dentist that, um, you know, the, 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 the child is born without testing positive to streptococcus mutans, pigeons, valleys, herpes, all these things. And then the mother uh, most likely is the one who infects the child. Uh, but when the baby's edentulous, um, there's no place for an anaerobic bacteria to grow. So she doesn't really transmit the infection to the, the baby until the first baby tooth pops out. And there's a layer of tissue over there. And then the anaerobic bacteria for streptococcus mutans, pigeons, valves, whatever, it can now live in the place. So then if you look at the other end of life and you look at periimplantitis, if you extract all the, all the gum disease teeth and they go fully edentulous, does that eradicate the P. gingivalis in the mouth? And then if you placed implant cases, there would not be periimplantitis or is that an oversimplification? Well, there's been four studies that have looked at this, exactly what you're talking about, comparing periimplantitis to the completely edentulous patient to one that is dentate. In all those studies, the patient that is completely edentulous has less periimplantitis than the patient that's dentate. So that is more or less relative to the study. If I look at the studies of which periimplantitis exists, the vast majority of the more recent studies show that the probing depth of the implant sulcus is in excess of six millimeters when there's periimplantitis. So that one of the maintenance protocols I have for when I'm evaluating an implant, we're evaluating it, of course, for rigidity, should be no clinical mobility. That's the easiest test. Is there any mobility? I have a sulcular evaluation. And for some reason, this is controversial. In Europe, they believe you shouldn't probe next to an implant, that you can induce bacteria into the sulcus by probing into the area. My teachings, I say we should evaluate the pocket depth, the probing depth, so that if the probing depth starts to get six millimeters or more, an anaerobic environment is more likely and the incidence of anaerobic bacteria will go up. Now, that doesn't mean that every pocket depth of six millimeters or more has anaerobic bacteria. In one study we did, 10% of the time, it would have anaerobic bacteria. So your risk factor goes up by one out of 10, would have anaerobic bacteria once the probing depth got, got greater than six millimeters. If it was less than five millimeters, we didn't see anaerobic bacteria. Apparently the oxygen tension is such that anaerobic bacteria isn't growing in sulcus steps of less than five millimeters. So I'm looking at what are the primary things that cause marginal bone loss. Look at 
Implant design is one of the factors. An implant that is rough at the very top will collect bacteria more than one that's machined or smooth at the very top. On the other hand, one that's machined or smooth, bone has more trouble staying attached to. So it's a discussion that literally I can have for six, seven hours. But the bottom line is, if the patient is partially edentulous, if they have teeth, they should get prophylaxis on a regular basis to decrease the risk of anaerobic bacteria around their natural teeth, which they should anyway. And once the probing depth gets greater than six millimeters around my implants, I'm going to monitor it. And if it's out of the aesthetic zone, I'll do a gingiplasty. I'll decrease the pocket depth to get it less than six millimeters to decrease the risk of peri-implantitis contributing to a future problem for the patient. So, yeah, so it's a concern that, that I have in the monitoring of the patient. Um, but if you're in Europe, they'll tell you don't probe. So back back to the periimplantitis. Uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about uh, cleaning around the periimplantitis with a laser. Uh, you know, these there's these uh, like a little nap procedure where uh, you can clean around it. Um, some people, and then the other the other major questions are um, if you're scaling around that periimplantitis. Some people say you can't use the metal. The, the hygienist doesn't know if she can use the metal scaler. Um, other hygienists are told you need to have special plastic implant cleaners. So, on peri so you have a case with periimplantitis. Would you use a LANAP procedure around it, or would you use a, a laser um, to clean it, or would you use metal scalers, plastic carriers? Would you put them on antibiotics, mouthwashes? When it comes to the laser, if you're going to quote me, date me. Um, <laughs> Bob, Bob James used to say that. If you're going to quote me, date me because we just don't have enough information on this. I can tell you one study that we did with, at Temple with John Suzuki. He was given a laser for the school. We infected the bacteria with a anaerobic bacteria with RAMS, probably the top microbiologist in the country. So we had this difficult medium with which we grew this bacteria on the surface of the implant that could contribute to periimplantitis, been reported to be involved with periimplantitis. We hit it with the laser, and then we put the implant back into the difficult medium to see if the anaerobic bacteria could still grow. It grew. It did not get rid of the anaerobic bacteria. So I've got one study, the laser didn't make a difference. I've got a couple faculty members that I really value their evaluation. They've been involved in several cl clinical studies with me and they say that in their clinical practice they've had some really good results using a laser in conjunction with treatment of periimplantitis. So they're documenting their cases. We're going to do have find somebody that's not having good results and have a similar protocol, and so this is something I'll have to report to you in the future. I'll tell you what I'm currently doing. I take a cross-cut fissure burr, a cross-cut fissure burr from Rassler, and I mechanically go around an implant, and since the primary implants I use are threaded, have some type of thread depth, I go over the surface of the implant and I reduce the thread depth so that the outer thread depth and the inner thread depth become more similar. So I don't have these nidises where bacteria can hide out within the implant body. And then I apically position the tissue. Then I take acid, and because I'm a restoring dentist, I can take these acids that have a gel, and instead of applying it to enamel, I take the acid and apply it to the implant body so it doesn't leach into the bone and kill bone cells and things like that. So I put the gel on the implant body and have it there for a minute or two, whatever my patience allows for this particular case, to help the acid denature any aspect of it, which is really important if the implant has any hydroxylapatite coating on it because hydroxylapatite acts just like cementum. And the reason why you add a 
tetracycline or an acid on the surface of a tooth is it gets contaminated. The cementum does. Well, so does an implant body. And this bacteria smear layer, the best way I've seen to get rid of it is mechanically. It doesn't, chemical things don't work effectively on bacteria smear layers. So that's why I use the burr, the, not a cross cut. It's a burr that has a parallel flutes in it that when it cuts, it leaves a shiny surface. And I get rid of the surface of the implant body and reduce the thread depth of the implant body. And then depending if the implant is in the aesthetic zone or not aesthetic zone, it's easier if it's out of the aesthetic zone, I apically position the tissue so that the sulcular depth will be less than six millimeters. The majority of the time that, are, oh, antibiotics before, hygiene appointment with the remaining teeth before, um, if it's in the aesthetic area, usually I'll put in a material that I don't expect to grow bone, something like a bioos or a dense ceramic material to plump up the tissue and with or without a collagen membrane. That doesn't seem to be the difference on the result that you get. And you follow it up with antibiotics also, chlorhexidine and antibiotics. It's harder to treat than a periodontally diseased tooth. So back to <clears throat> periimplantitis, and it's kind of close to um, the, the cement. What were the, when you said the number one, two, and three cements used for cementing uh, crowns were, uh, in, crowns on implants were radiolucent and growing aerobacteria. What were the brand names of those three crowns? Funny, they have the word implant in them. So if it says implant cement, those are the worst. <laughs> and they're the most common ones used. So it's, it's like we should bring a class action suit against them, you know? Can you say the brand names? Do you, do you, uh, you know, it's been a while and I uh, well, don't. Or the, or the, I remember they have the word implant in them. Well, and I remember see, that, that, that several of the companies like 3i purchased the rights to sell it. And so the implant company then sells it. And if it has the word implant in the cement, don't use it. What would you recommend? Now, the cement? in order for cement to be radiopaque, at least the current, last time I did this study, it had to have zinc in it. Zinc phosphate. So the best cement was zinc phosphate. It was the most radiopaque. It was the easiest one to clean. It had the longest working time if you used a cool sl slab. You don't have to worry about the acid causing irritation, any dental tubules or anything like that. And it had the highest compressive strength. So if you're looking for a non-retrievable cement, the best one was zinc phosphate. And doesn't it also have the lowest water solubility? Well, I, I remember. I, I, no, glass ionomer has a little less water solubility, but that doesn't seem to be a major factor for an implant prosthesis. Well, I remember back in uh, University of Missouri, can't say they said they wanted us to cement the mandibular second molar crowns with zinc phosphate just because, because that was the hardest one to isolate to keep dry when you cement. Our instructor said you might get water contamination, so mandibular second molars use zinc phosphate. Yeah, well, from the study that we were involved in, if you're going to be have moisture contamination, Glass ionomer works better than zinc phosphate. However, if water is taken out of the issue, zinc phosphate won on every, everything. Bacteria grew less, longest working time, easiest to clean up without scratching the surface, radiopaque in, in, in minimum thicknesses. By far the best cement was zinc phosphate. Now, the disadvantage is zinc phosphate has the highest compressive strength. Well, the highest is resin cement, which happens also to be the most popular cement. Resin cement is not radiopaque. Resin cement grows anaerobic bacteria like crazy. So the cement, cement you should, and it's hard to clean up. You often have to scratch the surface to clean it. And often you end up leaving some behind because it's radiolucent. So probably the worst cement is the most common one that's used. And that's anything that has to do with the same cements that you're using for veneers, don't use it. 
on implants. That's the worst. That's the worst one. Okay. If I want something retrievable, and I call it soft access cement, I tell the patient it's soft access cement. I don't use the word temporary cement because the money's due. So it's not temporary, it's the final cement. But it's temporary cement. <laughs> You know, and the, the temporary cements that have zinc in them are good implant cements. They're, it allows the restoration to be retrievable. It's radio-opaque. Bacteria doesn't grow on it. Uh, it's got a long history of, of use. And so, yeah, temporary cement. Yeah, temporary cement, the crown comes off. For example, a single tooth crown, temporary cement, the crown often comes off. So for a single tooth crown, temporary cement is too soft access many times. But I start with the temporary cement anyway. It's easiest, it's cheap, easy to clean, lots of advantages to it. So temporary cement. Any brand name? Uh, anything with zinc in it, which almost all of them do. Tempon, and anything, any, whatever, whatever you use, temporary cement. Now, if that doesn't work, I go to polycarboxylate cement. Duralon? Duralon. That's the brand name that I use. Now, the one only issue with Duralon is it is more retentive than the tempons, than the temporary cements, and I use it for single teeth much more satisfactorily than the temporary cement. doesn't come out as often. It's got a better tensile strength, basically, because that's where the cements break down is from their tensile strength rather than anything else. Compressive strengths most cements, if they're put under compression, won't break down. But Duralon, the package insert, says don't use with titanium because it can cause corrosion. I've been part of a study at Alabama for about 30 years. Alabama has had this study in which any failed implant gets sent to the dental school and we evaluate the implant with OJ analysis and electron microscopy and we look for the cause of failure and what's happened to the metal and, and things like that. We have never seen corrosion related to titanium with Duralon. Never seen it once. We have seen an anode cathode effect of gold and stainless steel crowns next to each other affecting an implant with an anode cathode effect. But we have never seen corrosion of a um, margin because of Duralon, but the manufacturer put down that it could increase the risk of corrosion if used on an implant, on titanium. Because of that manufacturer statement, you'd be wise to at least one know that and just say that you're using it outside this, the, the scope of that. If you can do it as a doctor. You can take a antibiotic and use it outside the directions by on an individual basis you have that right as a doctor and so I decide as a doctor to use the cement on implants on a patient basis patient by patient basis um, and I've been using it for 30 some years I've never seen corrosion corrosion what the fear of corrosion is it could decrease the pH, especially if you were in an infected implant sulcus, because infection accelerates corrosion. And if you have corrosion of a surface, it can decrease the pH and therefore dissolve the bone in the area. Never, I don't have any pitting corrosion, crevice corrosion. But there's six different types of corrosion. We've looked for all of it, haven't seen any of it. But the manufacturer has that, and so some smart ass that reads package inserts, which is almost nobody in dentistry, may ask you a question, well, what about corrosion? Well, tell them, Mish has evaluated, has never seen it, and again, until I see something that's documenting um, that indeed there's a clinical problem associated with this, Duralon is the cement that I've used the most often in an implant practice. So then it does have zinc in it too? I'm sorry? So then Duralon has zinc in it also? Yeah, Duralon has zinc in it. It's radio-opaque, 
bacteria doesn't grow on it. It's an excellent implant cement and has a higher shear strain, tensile strain than the temporary cements. If that breaks loose, if that doesn't work, you need something harder than Duralon, then I'd go to zinc phosphate. How if, you you use zinc, if you use zinc phosphate though, you're not trying to make it a retrievable restoration. Indeed, you may have trouble getting the restoration off. How are you doing for time, Carl? You, you good? You need to take a break? You want to keep going? I mean, I'm- It's up I'm, to you, Chief. I'm, oh you know, it's, it's up, up to you. I don't, you know, when it, once I start talking about implants, there is no clock. I just- <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, Well, so I want to, I want to go back because this is a, back, back to um, the biology of periimplantitis. Would, is, is, it, is it an oversimplification to say that someone who lost all their teeth from dental decay, streptococcus mutans, would have a far higher success rate than someone who lost their teeth from periodontal disease, P. gingivalis? Is, is periodontal... No, no there, there is one guy that wrote a paper that talked about advantages of implant prostheses in which he said that patients that lost teeth from trauma in theory would have a higher success rate with implants because implants can resist trauma more than natural teeth. They don't break as readily. That a patient that lost their teeth from periodontal disease may be at a higher risk for implants because implants do get periodontal disease. That patients that lost their teeth from decay in theory would have a higher success rate with implants rather than teeth because implants don't decay. So it, it was it was an interesting um, article. Um, largely bullshit. I mean, I, <laughs> let's, you know, let's, I, let's, I mean, I, I mean, it's one of those things where I think street. It's one of those things. If you got a, if you're a university professor, you got to write a paper every five years. That's an interesting paper that requires no clinical study just hypotheses and will entertain you for the three minutes to read it. So let, let's move over to uh, sinus lifts. Um, you know, I remember, you know, seeing, uh, you, I, I remember back in the day when you take a boiled egg and you would uh, chip around the boiled egg and learn how to do a sinus lift on a boiled egg. Um, Tatum, oh, yeah. had, Tatum had his, um, his approach. By the way, Tatum, I guess he moved from Florida to Europe. Or He did. He, he got married to a, a wonderful woman. And um, she lives out there in France and lives in a cat, basically as a castle, beautiful place, has its own church on the property, um, a huge garage of which he hand makes these instruments, it takes them all day to make one instrument. And he sells it for like $25 and his hands are all chewed up and nails broken off his fingers because well, he has them in these lathes making his own instrument but he likes doing it and that, uh, yeah i love the guy he's a good guy yeah they say you only change countries uh for three reasons uh and it's a third for a love third for a job and thirds running from the law so she must be one hell of a woman to get him to move from florida yeah. to uh to france but um there's so many different uh well, she's from france she didn't move it's her home that he moved into yeah so there's so many different sinus lifts being taught. And of course, you know, I'm going back to your theme of sometimes uh, better, faster, easier isn't always the most predictable long term. Is there any, and, and I want to, and I'm going to try to aim this at the, you know, the most common implant placed, I would you agree, is replacing the first molar? Well, yeah, yeah, it is. It, let's start off by saying uh, a sinus graft of which we agreed in the profession there was a sinus graft consensus a number of years ago of which we all agreed to call it a sinus graft the sinus lift <coughs> is used for those individuals that attempt through the implant osteotomy attempt through then the lifting up the floor of the sinus the sinus mucosa lifts with it and they call that a sinus lift if you're a periodontist, you may call, call that the Summers technique because in the perio literature, a guy named Summers first published a couple papers on it and developed an instrument that he put his name on 
of which you impact the floor of the sinus and you elevate it and hopefully the sinus mucosa comes up. So that's what we'll call the sinus lift. The sinus graft is where we'll typically most often come through the lateral wall and put graft material on the floor. What has become very popular is this lift procedure from the crest of the ridge, which I should say a couple of things. One is that technique was developed by Tatum. Tatum, 20 years before Summers published a paper, was teaching, taught me, many others, that technique of lifting up the sinus floor through the implant osteotomy. Therefore, don't call this the Summers technique. Call it the Tatum technique. If you choose to put a season on the technique, I'll call it the winter's technique because summer's was two seasons too late and 20,000 implants too few to put his name on it. So <laughs> I'll never call it summer's. I'd call it maybe winter or something like that. <laughs> the reality is he's attempted to, he attempted to steal the technique from Tatum, kind of like the Caldwell Luck technique. An American ENT invented the Caldwell Luck technique. Uh, sir, his name is Caldwell, a French guy came over on the boat, learned the technique, went back to France, started teaching the technique and put his name on it, called it the luck technique. They argued their whole life who originated the technique and when they died, the profession put both their names on it and called it the Caldwell luck technique. Well, this should just be called the Tatum technique. Summers has no claim to anything related to it other than maybe making an instrument for it. So should the Caldwell luck technique just be called the Caldwell technique? Just call it a Tatum technique, you know, <laughs> or you know, that's, that's, Kim Tatum is, is, is rightful due. Now, anybody that has done a few sinus graphs, knows that the bigger the access window to the antrum, the easier it is to elevate the mucosa. Stress equals force divided by area. If you have a very small window, there's higher stress put against the sinus mucosa and you're more apt to tear it. That's why people I train, I say that the lateral access window should be somewhere around 10 by 10, or 10 by 15 millimeter. If you put a three millimeter diameter osteotomy, which basically if you're going through the implant osteotomy to, to lift the floor of the sinus, the diameter of that hole is about three millimeters in diameter. In addition, it's often 10 millimeters deep in the bone. You can't see to the, the sinus floor. You, so you put this instrument in and you bang it and you pray that the floor goes up along with the sinus mucosa. Then you take an x-ray because you put some graft material in there and you see something really opaque and you say, yeah, it's successful. That's all BS. At Temple, one of the residents did a sinus lift technique on cadavers and every time the sinus membrane was torn. If you put graft material into that osteotomy and attempt to pack it like we used to do amalgam in the old day, you increase the risk that you'll tear the sinus mucosa. If you tear the sinus mucosa, the implant and or graft is in the implant sin is in the sinus proper. If it's in the sinus proper, there's a chance that a bacteria smear layer will get on the implant body because sinuses often get infected. If a, if a smear layer gets on the implant body, the body is not able to get rid of the bacteria. It grows on the implant body. There's no blood vessels that go to the implant body and that bacteria acts as a nidus for future sinus infections and you can't fix it. I've had to multiple times go in and cut off the end of an implant sitting into the sinus proper to get rid of the bacteria smear layer to get rid of the chronic sinusitis that the patient was having. So that the, the worst technique you could use is this sinus lift Summers procedure, 
If you're going to graft the floor, it's one of the most predictable places to grow bone. One of the most predictable places to grow bone is the floor of the sinus. If you don't tear the mucosa. And it's very simple to do. It takes less than 10 minutes. You've seen me do it in, at the Institute in probably five minutes. It's, it's a rather simple procedure. And it's very predictable if you come in from the lateral wall and you don't tear the mucosa. If you come through the crest of the ridge, then it becomes unpredictable. And what type of bone would you put in there? I'm sorry? What type of bone would you put on in that sinus graft through the lateral wall? Almost anything works. I, I, the only material that in a study was done that did not work was demineralized bone. Demineralized bone, evidently, in sockets. We did a study in sockets. Another study was done in sinus grafts, and it was not predictable. Because the bone is, has no hydroxyl appetite crystals left, the bone is broken down rather quickly through a cell-mediated resorption and doesn't maintain the space long enough for a new bone to fill the site. So the worst material you could use in a socket or the worst material you can use on the floor of the sinus is demineralized bone allograft. A better material is mineralized bone because the hydroxyl appetite crystals are still present. The resorption of the material through the monoclasts in the body circulate and form osteoclasts in the site and the osteoclasts start to break it down and then a blood vessel comes in from bone and brings osteoblasts with it and forms bone in the site. That's the scientific reaction that we've established and have published in every textbook that I've got. The studies that I did on the monkeys and in humans and the reentry um, biopsies that I have of the case, cases. Um, but almost anything works. There's uh, BioOS works. It doesn't have, you know, um, something that maintains a space long enough for bone to be able to grow into the space. Would you prefer... So something oh would you always prefer harvesting something from their jaw in another area, you know, back in the ramus or somewhere? Well, it is, it's interesting. You know, in theory, you think autologous bone would be the best material. In a study done out of LSU, they compared different materials, and it was presented at a sinus graft consensus that I was at, and the material that worked the worst was iliac crest trabecular bone. So autologous bone turns out to be the worst because it acts very much like demineralized bone. It doesn't maintain the space long enough for it to work predictably. So I wouldn't use iliac trabecular bone. It's not dense enough. I wouldn't use the tuberosity. It's not dense enough. I can use the tuberosity with a mineralized bone source. I can use it, you know, as, as a filler. But if I'm looking at using one material, a mineralized bone source works better than a demineralized bone source. And the tuberosity wouldn't work as well as cortical bone. So cortical bone from the chin. As a general rule, I try to teach my, treat my patients like I'd like to be treated. I'd rather not have to have part of my hip harvested to do a sinus graft if I have a easier solution, like mineralized bone. Maybe if I was working on an ex-wife, fine, okay, harvest the hip. <laughs> but if I'm working on a patient... So, so you know, someday we'll have to meet at a bar and compare ex-wife notes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, and by the way, that uh, Dental Town Continued Education class you put up uh, a year ago, that socket grafting and clinical assessment of missing teeth, that, that, that's, that's one of our, that, that's our Hall of Fame online C course. I mean, that, that, that was amazing. That, Thank that, you. That, that was beyond amazing. So, so a lot of people are talking about spinning blood. Are you a big spinning blood uh, fan? Well, I mean, if, if I look at first growth factors, 
Growth factors is a very popular subject in orthopedics and in oral surgery and in implant dentistry. Some people give four hour, five hour lectures on growth factors now. Um, some are very expensive, like Infuse. Some are relatively cheap, like spinning blood down without adding anything to it. And where do I stand on this? Well, I have been involved in multiple studies. What I can say is that too many lecturers, especially ones that are selling you something, <laughs> they're selling you a product. What percent of lecturers in dentistry are trying to sell you something? What percent would you yeah. guess? Uh, I don't know, probably half. Yeah. Because that's how they're getting their lecture fee. The company gives them money to give the lectures. And so they may not be getting 10% of what you buy, but the company is giving them $4,000 to give the lecture. And you don't know about it. But if we're looking at the effectiveness of platelets to grow bone, if platelets had half the ability to grow bone as what some lecturers say, we wouldn't have red blood cells in our vessels, we'd have bone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, that is that is hilarious. Now, on the other hand, if I'm looking at blood vessel growth in soft tissue, I've got several studies showing that there is an enhancement of blood vessel growth in soft tissue. When it comes to bone grafting, the soft tissue growing over a graft site is important. If I have incision line opening, I'll have decreased success rate of the graft so that if I'm trying to get soft tissue growth in the area, platelets may enhance that a little, a little, because it does increase blood vessel growth in soft tissue. If I'm trying to decrease pain, I've heard there's less pain because of the platelets. I've seen no study supporting that if you use platelet growth factors, either dense or non-dense, or whatever, double spin or not, I've seen no difference in the number of pain pills are taken or no difference in a pain index study, whether you use platelets or not. So I'm not using it to decrease pain. However, in my private practice, I have a general rule that says if I'm going to do an implant surgery and or tissue graft, one of us have to be sedated. That's better if it's the patient is sedated rather than me. So that most all of my surgeries that I've done in my clinical practice have been with IV sedation. As a consequence, since I'm already got a needle in a vein, to do the IV sedation, it's very simple for me to draw up some blood and spin it down. And if I use the platelets and I choose to use, for example, mineralized bone, it sticks the mineralized bone together and makes it a little more clinically friendly so it doesn't get sucked up by the aspirator or flown, or just, I, I can position it more friendly within a sinus graft. So I use it, and I've got more than 20 cores with and without it, and I can tell you it's probably the least important factor. A little bit of bone, even if it's tuberosity, is better than a whole bunch of mLs of blood. There are more growth factors in cortical bone, a hundred times more growth factors in cortical bone than in blood. So if you scratch some cortical bone and the nasal spine or the symphysis or the ramus, and you put some of that cortical bone within your graft, that's a hundred times better than drawing 50 cc's of blood and spinning it down. 
you remember that movie Fargo where at the end they put that person in a wood chipper and pulverize him? That 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 cult movie. M- Megagen has that little machine now where you take an extracted. I don't know of any study. I don't. I, I don't think I've seen the one that you're talking about. However, if I look at a natural tooth, a natural tooth, the enamel is dense hydroxylapatite. The cementum and the dentin is a less dense hydroxylapatite. That is, at least in theory, could be a bone substitute material. In theory, you could take out a tooth, chip it up, grind it up, use that in conjunction with your graft, and it should work. Now, is the tooth infected? Is the cementum infected? You know. You would want to decontaminate the cementum of the tooth somehow because you don't want to carry the bacteria with it. Cementum is a great carrier for bacteria smear layer. But it is true that a tooth is made of hydroxylapatite. Therefore, in theory, could be a good bone graft material. Would you buy it? Would you start using it or would you wait for... uh... Would, do you think it's bleeding edge technology or do you think it's worth the buy and leading edge to get a... I would put together a team and do the study for them. If they ever came to the Institute, I'd grab my faculty. We never show anything at the Institute unless we've done a study. Doesn't mean that I personally have to do it. If I know the people that did the study and if I look at the protocol and I evaluate their data, many people don't know that when you write a scientific article that gets published, let's say in the Journal of Implant Dentistry, Nobody has reviewed the data of that publication. I can literally write a paper tonight saying that I did something 300 times and that it worked 299 times and I had two incision line complications and I put that data in the article and I sent it to the publisher and nobody ever asked to see the original data. Which is really a joke because I personally know at least three people that have made up sinus graft studies, made up implant studies, in which they never even did the procedure. They just wrote down some numbers and hypothesized what the percentage should be. And that's one of the biggest fallacies we have in refereed studies. These, I'm talking about refereed publications. Nobody looks at the original data. Now, before I teach anything, either I do the study or I see the original data with researchers that I know aren't cheating because I know it's so easy to do. So, I have not done a study grinding up the tooth and putting it in. I'm willing to do it. It makes sense from a histologic point of view. But because no study was done, I don't know what the incidence of infection would be. I don't know how long it would take to resorb. I don't know what the protocol of getting rid of contaminated cementum or decay may be. But I'm willing to have my team do the study because on a science-based level, it shows potential. Are you... Uh, do you uh, talk to the CEO of uh, the founder of Megagen? I mean, are you going to ask him or do you want me to ask him for you? Or? Never call me. I don't know him. I don't <clears throat> don't know anything about it. Well, uh, um, what, what's the best way? You want me to email, email you or call you or what, what's the best way for me to contact? I, I'm going to put that. Yeah, uh, contact the Institute. My faculty at the Institute, I, that's who I would enroll for the study. And you do that in Florida or Vegas or LA? Well, what we do, what we do is, or, or do you, you say know, Michigan? First, I put out a, a memo to the faculty: which of you are interested in doing a, this particular study? They need to have enough patience. For example, this study should be easy to enroll because it's related to extractions, and so the faculty that do extractions and sign it in socket graphs enough that they can contribute data to the study. Are they willing to put their, you know, have a signed consent form and have a, you know, the patient 
is evaluated as far as risk and there the patient is knows that this is a study that they're enrolling in and so it's a uh, you know once those papers are put in order I'm willing to sign off on it because it makes scientific sense to me and I'm sure that I could get faculty to enroll but then we have to do the study I, I think it'd be an amazing study because it's just one of those things where you saw it and you thought, oh, my God, this is too good to be true. Yeah. I mean, does, does it does it uh, interest you? I mean, to be able to just grind up the extracted tooth and use that, I mean, wouldn't that be just too easy? As long as the uh, cementum isn't contaminated, I, like I told you, bacteria smear layers are not easy to get rid of. And so you I'm, probably have to, you know, take a burr and strip off the cementum that's exposed um, to decrease any infection risk. But again, I'm hypothesizing, I have not done it. I'm just- I wanna go back I'm to a statement you said that when you place an implant, usually the person is under sedation. And I notice there's a lot of um, international um, noise about the fact that in the United States, if you go into hospitals, the surgeon never is doing the anesthesia. They separate that. And the UK noticed that um, when their oral surgeons were also doing the sedation and the oral surgery, there was more, you know, problems than when you separated. Do you think? Do you think it's standard of care to be able? A lot of dentists are learning IV sedation, and they're learning IV sedation because they want to place implants. But do you think that's a good idea, or do you think you should focus on the implants and have an anesthesiologist come in and do the sedation? Oh, Howard, um, there are very few things that we do in dentistry that one mistake, you lose your license. One of those is IV sedation that leads to death. I know of three implant dentists that had a patient die during implant surgery and they were doing intravenous sedation and it was an anesthetic death although one of them the, the assistant said the patient bled to death it was doing a synthesis graft and there was a lot of bleeding and so she told the uh, evaluator that the patient bled to death which i'm sure was not true but indeed there was a death and the other were anesthetic deaths and in each case the doctor lost their license. So I, this is, you know, here, here we go back to the risk that you're willing to take as a doctor within your private practice. Are you willing to do procedures that if they fail, the patient will sue? Are you willing to do procedures of which a complication includes death? This is a, a, a decision that you personally have to make. Um, I know that if you don't do any procedure often, you're not very good at it. You know, those of us that do IV sedation, we do several cases every day. Well, we get pretty good at it. You know, you do hundreds of cases a year. If you do one case a year, if you're only doing two implant surgeries a year, and therefore you only do two IV sedations a year, eh, why don't, you know, bring somebody in. Um, especially do you, do you like that, to do your own sedation or do you always like to have an, uh, someone else do it? Well, it's, it's easier for me to do my own, you know, um because coordinating the schedule with the anesthesiologist is a is another you know issue for the staff however the when i've done that if i have a patient that is an asa let's say three I, i'm not as comfortable with this patient as i am with an asa one i'll have an anesthesiologist anesthesiologist come in and it's nice they come in and they review the history again and they call the patient up afterwards and they make sure the patient's all right and they stay with the patient afterwards and they give them a lot of TLC and it's like having another staff member for that particular surgery. And so 
once you do it, you come up with 10 great reasons why it makes sense. The one disadvantage, you don't get the income for it instead of an income producer. And it is an income producer. If you add 400 to $500 for every surgery you do, and I used to do two a day, well, that's another 800 to thousand dollars every day that I worked in my practice, just because I did sedation. Yeah, it makes it easier to, to draw the blood. For so I would, of course, I would do platelet-rich plasma. Why not? I already got the thing drawn, and you and you charge another 25 to 50 dollars for the procedure. So it's a it's a it's just like a CAT scan. I mean, once you buy the CAT scan, you realize, hell, I'm generating enough income every year to buy a new one. That it, it's not a detriment, this $100,000. I'm generating more than $100,000 a year because I have it. So it's kind of like what we talked about before. I mean, the screen that is in front of you that lets certain facts in and certain facts stick is modified as your experience is modified. Well, while we're on the subject of anesthesiology, they're trying to get recognized especially. Do you think someday dental anesthesiology will be, uh, the, the American Dental Association recommends nine specialties, the dental anesthesiologists or anesthesiologists are trying to get recognized especially. There's always, always been movements for uh, implantology to be a specialty. I've, I've heard that the, um, the, the periodontist actually put it up for a vote. They, they dismissed by a couple of votes trying to change your name from periodontist to periodontist and implant surgery. Well, do, so my direct question, do you think implantology should be a specialty? Do you think dentist yeah. anesthesiology well, you know, should I, be a specialty? I'm prejudiced to that. I'm the one that wrote the first specialty application, which was sponsored by the ICOI. I'm the one that wrote the special, second specialty application, which was sponsored by the AAID, and I'm the one that wrote, was on the head of the committee that wrote the third application. <laughs> so I am highly um, prejudiced on this. However, in my personal belief, which means, you know, religion, basically, um, it makes no sense to me that endo and some of these other things we have, for example, radiology is a specialty and implants is not. What, what about pediatric genetics, just a, a small patient? To me, if implants was a specialty, we'd have more research money coming into the field. We'd have better clinical studies that would be done because all the residents would be forced to do clinical studies and write papers that patients, if they had a complication, could go to places that just like an endo complication probably is best treated by an endodontist. Well, an implant complication could be treated by somebody like myself that had an implant complication practice that's done the procedure for 30 years that has taught the procedure for 30 years. And it will probably never happen because of the politics of dentistry that within a dental school, implant dentistry is a income center. And because it is such a good income center, every interfacing specialty wants to control it within the dental school. So that you'll have, every, in every school there is a fight, who controls the implant patients? When I was at Pittsburgh, the dean made me the implant czar and every implant patient that came in, I would have a Tuesday night meeting in which all implant candidates would be reviewed and oral surgery and perio and ortho and endo and every specialty was invited. And at the end of the night, I would decide which of the groups would treat this particular patient for this particular treatment plan that we came up with that night. It was a great experience for me because you see how different specialties treatment plan the same patient. And indeed there are differences from one specialty to another as far as what they see and, and what they therefore do treatment planning. You know, it's not a coincidence that a doctor that likes aesthetic dentistry ends up doing a lot of veneers. 
it's not a coincidence that a guy that likes implant surgery ends up doing a lot of implant surgery. They treatment plan for it. They like it. They see it. They Every opportunity with every patient, they bring it up. And within a relatively short time, your practice is molded into your likes and or dislikes based purely on your prejudice, on what you see. It is the way you say it is within your practice. I think we should have an implant specialty so that we can have standards of care so we can have more research so that we can have more documented studies so we can have patients treated by people that do this for a living um, for all the other reasons we have these other specialties and certainly in my opinion implant dentistry is much more complex than some of the other specialties that have been developed I, I agree, and for my litmus test is, <clears throat> you know, I'm not dentist-focused, thinking about the needs of the oral surgeon and the periodontist, all that stuff. I'm looking at the, the patient, and the, the patient has the right to know of someone who this is all they do. And if we are a profession of patient-centered people, and you are sit there and you got a mess in your mouth for a myriad of reasons, whether it was complications, there, you should be able, as a consumer, to be able to go to a website and look up yeah, here's Carl Misch. He's a implantologist specialist. You know what I mean? I mean, the only thing right now that the public is aware of is the services provided at this, for example, all on four ad. You have a television ad. Who decides if you're on that ad? Well, you pay $20,000. You give the money, and it's like a pyramid scheme of which the first guy that's in got, gets the most, and the second guy that got in gets the second most, and they distribute that money between everybody else that's already been into it, and they all agree that they're going to spend $200,000 a year on advertising, and you can get on that site with no training at all. You can still be a dental student and be on that site, just by calling them up and say, I want to be there, and here's my $250,000, so put my name in there too. And all of a sudden, now you're being interviewed, and oh, implants have an advantage, and then, and then, because you read the chapter of my book as far as what to say, and you've never even done it yet. This doesn't make sense to me. It, you could never do that in Endo. You couldn't put a TV ad out saying, endo done in one appointment and uh, cheap material and you take a toothpick and you shove it down the canal and break it off and fill it up with amalgam. Now you can do it because you're a doctor and you have the right to do stupid things, but the public isn't protected doing that and certainly you shouldn't be advertising, but you can if you do implants. You haven't even done one yet and you got a TV ad. One of the most common questions I get the guy's gone through one weekend course with me. How do I get more patients? Slow down. If you're making, you haven't done any implants yet, you don't want to advertise yet. If, you do, if you're making a mistake, you, do, you made that mistake a hundred times before you realized it. Get, it. get the training first. Walk into this field. If you're going to learn how to play the piano, you don't book a concert. <laughs> you don't book a concert and have people listen to you play the piano on your first lesson. Carl, I'm going to only ask you one more question. I feel like I'm being too greedy. I got, I, I have so many questions I'd love to ask you. Um, the question is many implants. I mean, when in on Dental Town, we had to separate implantology from many implants because when people would start talking about many implants, you know, there was just – you, you could just name the people that go on there and just start trashing minis. Um, it was kind of like, uh, so finally we just separate them and said, okay. And because we have a report abuse button and you, you just can't go in and say mean things. But so what, what's your thoughts on mini implants? I almost think mini implants is kind of like where homosexuality was in the seventies. It's in the closet. Um, you're not respected. Yeah. If you go give a lecture, you got to place big boy implants, not these little, you know, gay yeah. mini implants. Yeah. So, uh, what, what's your thoughts on mini implants? Well, first of all, um, I question. I, I, you've been with me for a long time. I mean, twenty some years. 
I attempt to emphasize the people that I train, I try to um, develop them into a positive mold that I've seen is positive toward the profession. And certainly somebody of your stature, I'm going to try to influence as much as I can because you're going to reflect a positive image of what dentistry should be, is what my goal would be because you have a position of opportunity to have your, the easiest thing to do in any discipline is copy something that's working for somebody else. It's much easier to copy it than to create it yourself and go through the learning curves and all the associates. So pick out some leaders that are successful in the discipline that you're coming into and copy what they're doing. And make sure that that leader has integrity and, and is doing the right thing. In that mold, my attempt as a teacher is to, wherever possible, lean on the science and clinical studies to answer any question. Therefore, when somebody asks me a question about what do you think about, it kind of is stabbing me in the gut if the person is somebody that is held in high esteem. Because what they're telling me is studies and clinical aspects don't matter. What do you think? It's kind of like saying, what's your religion? Well, I'm a Catholic. So, yeah, well, I'm, a, I'm a Republican. That's what I think, okay? When it comes to implant dentistry, I, I, I put myself in a higher regard. I'm an educator, th therefore I'm gonna base my answer on clinical studies, personal experiences along with those studies and the science. So I'd reformat this question, because if you say, what do you think about, I could say anything. I think it's shit. What, what, what studies do you got? What do you, I think it's the best thing we ever did. What's that big? See, I want to say, okay, what are, have you done any clinical studies? What was the study involved? And then what does the science say? And then what is your observation of 30 years experience say? So I'm going to rephrase the question to be that way. Have I done any studies? Yes. In fact, my niece won the periodontal award the year that she graduated from Perry University of Michigan. Her master's thesis was on a mini implant wanted studies done on it. So we did studies based on these smaller implants being holding lower dentures and looked at the things that were being said. There were things being said like there's less pain. You don't have to reflect the tissue. There's fewer drills. Da, 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 there's less pain. So we did the study. We gave a pain index of regular implant size surgeries and the mini implant size surgeries we found the post-operative pain reported by the patient was exactly the same. We found the number of pain pills that they took after the surgery was exactly the same for a regular size implant or for a mini implant, that we found that at the suture removal, the tissue looked very similar to whether the tissue was reflected or whether it wasn't two, two weeks later. So many of the claims of the mini implant were we found to be bullshit based on no studies. We pulled every article on the mini implant out for her master's thesis. We found many of them completely dishonest. They would have articles that would say long-term study, and you'd actually read the study and it's 18 months. We found one, I think it was Petron Garrow, long-term study, wasn't even a year. I mean, so, so in the title, they give you this bullshit, and so they can reference or whatever, and if you actually pull the article and read it, it doesn't even say anything about what the title was about. So people manipulate this shit because they're trying to sell you something or sell their course or doing whatever. The major proponent of this mini implant was a guy that never even placed him. He goes on sabbatical for a year and he comes back and he's the mini implant expert. So maybe instead of religion, he also learned, you know, God talked to him about implant surgery too, but he had no experience because he wasn't practicing dentistry that year. So how can you come back from a sabbatical and be the number one authority on, a, on something that you've never done? I just ask myself questions, you know? So <laughs> I, I know that, that if I was going to design an implant that was going to be elite, immediate loaded, I'd want an implant that would have great fixation and great surface area. Now, 
in my study of implant design, and you know that I've really studied implant design, I've literally measured the cellular turnover rate of bone cells next to different surface conditions and different implant designs. And I mean, I, my, my residents and I have gone into the extreme of implant design and surface conditions and things like that. And definitely what we've seen is there's a direct correlation to the strength of the bone and the percentage of bone implant contact to the area of an implant and to the area of the implant that is under compression rather than tension or shear. For example, if you measure the strength of bone in compression and then before it breaks and then measure the bone in tension, pulling force rather than compression, it's 30% it's weaker before it breaks in tension. In shear, it's 70% weaker in shear. This is numbers that you actually, you, you study, you're doing the study. There's a big difference between the type of the load. Then you look at the surface area and you look at the surface area before bone resorbs and it's directly correlated to the area. And then you look at the bone implant contact and it fixed it next to different implant designs. And your conclusion, so I don't rattle because literally I can talk two weeks on this subject. Your conclusion is, if I'm going to immediate load an implant, I'd like maximum fixation and maximum surface area. Okay, so if I look at a general design of an implant, does that mean that it would look closer to a screw or look closer to a nail? Many, many implants look closer to a nail than a screw. The depth of the thread is very minimum. The number of threads is very minimum. The fixation is very minimum. Every carpenter in the world knows that if you're going to drill a hole in different types of wood, that you're not going to use the same screw device in balsa wood as you are in oak. A nail works pretty good in oak. You're just pounding the nail in and you're putting it in by pure spreading, compression against the bone, and that nail works, holds a pretty good picture. You put that same nail in balsa wood or in plaster and you put a picture on it, the picture falls down. I mean, somebody that's not a doctor. Knows <laughs> the only one that believes this shit is a dentist because we have no studies on biomechanics that a carpenter understands these qualities better than a dentist. So... If I look at the mini implant, there, I, I would look at the design. Not all mini implants are the same. I would look for one that has deeper threads. I would look, look at one that has more threads. I would look at one that's made out of titanium alloy. We looked at the bending fracture resistance of the implant. The bending fracture resistance of materials in general is pi over four times the radius of the fourth power, which means if I have an implant half the diameter, it's 16 times weaker. Well, we did cyclic loading. We found that these mini implants, they would often break after 16,000 loads. Well, you have up to 500 loads a day if you don't have parafunction on a lower denture in the area because of the four meals you have. And if you look at the number of, the number of strokes that you have per food and all the rest of it, but you're well above 16,000 within a couple years. And so you want a material that's going to take a cyclic load so that it's not going to break. What we found is many of these things broke. Most dentists don't know that when I started implant dentistry back in the 70s, mid-70s, the most popular implant around the world was the mini implant and the subperiosteal in the blade. We stopped doing the mini implant almost immediately because they would either fail or fracture. The ones that were successful fractured and they had a higher failure rate. If I use a two piece implant that's regular size, I have the advantage that I have a whole selection of different abutments I can use. I can, I can cover it up, I can have it exposed, I can use a ball, I can use an angled abutment, I can use a cemented abutment, I use a screw retained abutment. I got a whole bunch of options how to restore this thing. I know that the implant is integrated before I make the prosthesis, whereas the mini implant, you're putting it in and making the sign of the cross. I mean, I hear lecturers say, well, you lose one out of four. We lost one out of four. 
And they'll say, you, you lose one out of four, but you just add another one. You take one out, you put another one in, and you co-cure the next one into the denture. It's not a big deal if you lose one, but where you lose them, you lose bone. And you're not putting them in the ideal implant sites. When you're looking at attachment replacement, the attachment, the ring, most of them are using some type of O-ring. The O-ring attachment replacement is related to wear, and the wear is related to mobility, and the mobility is related to the position and the number. And if you look at all those, other, those factors, the prosthesis stability and the attachment replacement and the complications of failure, it doesn't make financial sense. It, 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 it is something to promote on the radio, perhaps, because it seems like the two things you do, you take the course on one weekend and you take the radio advancement course, how to get the patients in on the next weekend, and most of those people stop doing it after they've done their first 10 cases. And so you look at their practice 10 years later, they're not doing the mini implant anymore. You do the regular size implant, submerged healing, you guarantee it's integrated before you start the prosthesis. You don't have to worry about the patient's diet. You don't have to worry about, you know, all the other factors related to it. Can it be done? Obviously, you can do a lot of things in medicine. It doesn't mean you should. You know, when I had my back surgery done, I had one surgeon want to go through the front. He pushes over the, the vessels and pushes over the, the lungs, and he, he says, it's a, I can get better access to where your surgery is if I come through the front. I don't want you going through the front. It might be easier for you, but it's not going to be easier for me if you cut through my belly button to get to my spine. You know, I go another guy that's done it a whole lot. He says, you should have uh, got some guys saying I can wait six months and some guys say I could get in right away. Well, what do I want to do? I, I, I like to do it around Christmas time. Are you working during Christmas time? Well, what's the most important thing for this? Finally, this guy, the one that ends up doing it, says you should have it done as soon as possible. When you have a nerve injury, the longer you wait, the harder it is for the nerves to regenerate back in the site. You won't be able to defecate without a bag. You won't be able to have sex again if you have any complication prior to this. I say, you know how to sell a treatment plan, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, you know, so faster, easier, cheaper wasn't what I was looking for on that, or easier for you. Don't go through the front because it's easier for you. Oh, it's about me. I'm the patient. So um, treat your patients like you'd like to treat your current wife. So your current wife. Carl, I think um, a lot of people um, might have been confused. <clears throat> can you explain how an implant, can you explain the difference between the three forces and, and how they fail an implant, shear versus tensile versus compressive? You, you said earlier in the interview that they, they don't fail from compressive strength, they fail from tensile strength, and then there's shear. Can you explain that or clarify that? Sure. Well, if I look where bone is most at risk, bone is, bone is most at risk to shear loads because it is the weakest under shear loads. What my- Will you explain a shear load versus sure. a tensile load uh, versus a compressive load? A compressive load is two forces acting opposing each other. So that like I'm doing a push up, and my hands are putting a compressive load on the ground and then my body goes up. That's a compressive load, okay? Um, cement, zinc phosphate cement. 15,000 pounds strong in compression. I bite on the crown, 15,000 pounds before the cement breaks. Tensile load, I lift up on the crown. I put a crown bridge remover underneath the margin and I bang up on it. That's a pulling force, a pulling force. Well, the cement goes from a 32,000 pounds per square inch, it goes down 30% the crown pops off. That's why you can get the crown off pulling up on it rather than, but you don't take a hammer and bang on top of the crown until the cement breaks. That doesn't make sense to you because you're putting it under compression. You lift up on it. A shear load is angular deformation, an angle load. Now the most common angle load we have in implant dentistry is either the implant body is put in at an angle and you put an angled abutment on it, of which that angled abutment 
means I'm going to put an angle load on the implant body. And if you look at the literature clearly, if I have an angled post, the abutment screw gets loose 30% more often. The crestal bone is lost with higher incidence because it's an angled load on the bone. And the angled load on the bone, the strength of the bone goes down. So there is a bullseye in biomaterials. And bullseye are compressive loads. Porcelain is strongest in compression. The marginal ridge of a implant crown, and you bite on the top of it, well now it's, that's actually a, a, a shear load to the framework. And the porcelain breaks on the marginal ridge because it's the type, type of the force changes from compression to shear, and porcelain isn't as strong in shear as it is in compression. And whether it's cement, or whether it's porcelain, or whether it's bone, different types of load, compression, tension, shear, result in different clinical results. And the, the strongest resistance to problems is under compression. So there's a consistent thread in biomaterials. The porcelain strongest compression, the cement is strongest compression, the screw works best under compression, the bone works work best under compression. The bone implant interface works best under compression. And my last studies, which surprised the hell out of me. You know, you, you, you get used to, as a bone researcher, you, at least what I did in the beginning is I treated bone almost as though it was inanimate, like it was wood. In fact, I compared bone to wood, different types of wood. And being a, a, a carpenter assistant, my dad owned a construction company and a uh, labor consistent. I knew that carpenters and construction people treat different materials with different respects as far as loads they take and designs of things that you fixate them with. But I, would, I was basically early in my career treating bone more like wood than as a viable organ. What we, this is a thinking organism. We now know that when an implant, we know that the implant design, we can design it to put more compressive load. For example, a square thread will put more compression than a cylinder. A cylinder puts more shear, okay? But if you smart, start measuring bone implant contact, where the tire meets the road is where the bone is touching the implant. It turns out that the highest areas, bone actually is touching the implant to transmit stress is where the areas are compression. For example, a V-shaped thread. The Branner Mark implant is a V-shaped thread. There is higher bone implant contact on the compressive portion of the thread than on the tensive portion of the, of the thread. So that where these different types of force, not only is the strength of the bone affected, the bone implant contact is affected. The cellular turnover rate is affected. When the bone remodels, it goes through a state of what's called woven bone, which is unorganized and less mineralized. Turns out when there's a shear load put on bone, there's more woven bone around the implant. The bone is weaker because it's a bone of repair. It's, it, the bone is repairing because of the type of load at the interface. It turns out this bone is probably smarter than most dentists. I mean, a 30 micron bone cell is smarter than a six foot six dentist. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But that's the way it is. That's the science of what we do. That's why we should be called doctor. That's why the carpenter is called mister. We should be called doctor and we should hold the criteria of what that entails. You just mentioned uh, Brandmark. How 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 do you, how will you remember Dr. Brandmark? Uh, really favorable. I, he and I had great respect for each other. He came to me when I first started BioRizon and came to the guys that were selling the product, and he said, "Mish is going to change the field of dentistry more than anybody else in its history, and that you should really focus on." on his science and what he's doing. He had great respect for, for me. I had had great respect for Unfortunately, he died this last year. I had great respect for him. Um, we were both on the same path. I mean, we were both trying to elevate the standard of care 
elevate what we do as clinicians. And um, yeah, so I, I, I wish he was still around because he had the right vision. He was trying to elevate the science of dentistry, although he wasn't a dentist, an orthopedic surgeon. So, Carl, you have the number one selling book in um, in dentistry. In fact, I think it was I think it was the number one selling book when I bought it twenty five years ago. Um, <laughs> Um, I was just wondering in 14 languages, but I was just wondering these, these kids, these days, days, the um, Amazon now over 50% of their books sold are audio and the actual physical book is now less than half. Um, Dental town has 205,000 members and next uh, quarter we're launching our audio book section and the, you sell that book through uh, what is it called? Elvisar or El El Elsevier. El Elsevier. Where, it's where's the Elsevier? Largest yeah, where's Elsevier out of? Is that out of Manhattan? Well, I think they're out of New York. But, um, yeah, yeah, New York. And I um, meet them. I, they're in New York. But, but, I, but I was wondering if, if you um, – I, I think to really, really reach these young kids, I, I think you'd reach a lot more dentists if you did an audio book. Do you think – your book could be an audiobook. I mean, you have 400 images in it. I mean, if you read that book in an audio file or you had someone read it, do you think um, the message would get across or do you think that an audiobook really can't be done for something in a profession that's hands on, like dentistry, especially surgery? Well, it sounds like you just gave me another project to do, Howard. <laughs> How long, how long do you think it take you to read your book? You know, you know as I said earlier, um, you should copy somebody that's doing something successful. It's a whole lot easier to copy than to do this yourself. You just told me the advantage of doing an audio book. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to you. I'm going to call the publisher up after we're done here and tell them, why don't we put out an audio book? Howard Ferran, we should do this. So you may get a call from them. Um, I, 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 would, I would love to because, Carl, you know, when we were little, it was the IBM mainframe. And then we lived through the personal computer. And last year now, 51% of the traffic is on the smartphone. And uh, Amazon. You know, you know what, what we started doing, when I, when I found out I had brain cancer and had a two-month life expectancy, one of the things that um, BioHorizon and the Institute did was to video me giving my session lectures. And so I think four sessions, maybe even five sessions, they brought in a, somebody to video me giving the lectures and they showed this, the slides and me giving the lecture for the, for the Institute to document what I was doing. So we could probably use that as a mechanism to um no it'd probably be better better just to read the book because some people like to hear it and see the words at the same time that's i learn best when i'm hearing it and i see it at the same time well do you sell um, the book now as a digital book like on a kindle we it's there is a it is provided on kindle or something where you can you know carry but not audible like instead of it. but not, but not audible. Audible. there's no audible how how could we get those courses on Dental Town? Those uh, those five courses filmed by you. Contact Heidi at Mish dot com. Mish dot com. You, if you've been through the institute, you get to see them free. Um, if you haven't been through the institute, then they're going to say, "Well, take session one if you want to hear session one," type of thing. But is there no? But I'm talking about on on the dentaltown dot dot com website. Talk to Heidi. I'd love to put them on anything that you want. You're, you and I are on a similar road, and the road is what should be done. Let's share what works and what's and do and, and let's do the right thing. And you've always you're not into how to rob the patient, you know, um, and that's what's stood so well for your career is people look to you and the things that you talk about and you put in your magazine work and it's a, a good format of, of information. I'd love to provide some of that vehicle through you. Um, so just talk to Heidi, what do you want? And it'll happen. Oh, uh, Carl, and you're I'll so sweet. What, what? And see if this, this audio thing will happen because of you. 
Yeah, and you know it would be so special for uh, you to read that book because you, I don't. How many hours do you think it would take you to sit down and just read your book? Well, if I was going to read it, yeah, I mean it's it's a large book. It's twelve hundred oh. pages. I mean it's <laughs> it's you know it was, I was taking a, a what fifteen of them out of the tr the trunk of a car in China and I blew a disc. So I literally had it broke my back. It was so heavy. So, so it's a heavy book. But you know, there's four thousand pictures. There, it, 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 yeah, it's um, yeah. Anyway, I would. I bet. It, I bet it'd take you thirty hours to read that book. But it'd be worth it. I mean, if somebody, oh, yeah. if, if it would help somebody do the right thing, it's certainly worth it. The the one thing that could be an issue is what I'd probably put in our little scenarios. I'd get to the end of some paragraph and it would remind me some story about some patient or whatever. That'd make it better. That'd make Which, it even better. That, yeah. and, oh my God, that'd even make it better. It's because otherwise I'd fall asleep. So I'd and have when, to add these you, stories that come to mind while I'm reading it. And, and talk about the pictures. I, I, think, I think they would bite. I, I think 50% of the dentists would buy the audio book. Um, I mean, yeah, Amazon's data is... Um, overwhelming but as they listen to, listen to the audiobook it makes them go back and buy the physical book because you would be talking about the all the pictures and they'd want to go back and see it carl what should we name this video what should we name this podcast uh howard friend live oh no no <laughs> no no but what, what should we call it oh i don't know um saturday night live <laughs> uh, I think, are you still there? I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not a marketing guy. You're the marketing guy. You're the okay, genius. I'll, I'll name it. Best. But hey, Carl. <laughs> That's it. I'm just a dentist. That's probably my, my most famous thing I say is I'm just a dentist. I'm just a dentist with Carl Mish. That is, that was, uh. That's cute. Hey, Carl. Um, seriously, um, you're my idol. You're everyone's idol. You're dentistry's rock star. You're you. Uh, I mean, you're just a legend beyond a legend. You did so much for my career and everyone I know's career. Um, thank you so much for spending uh time with me today. I can't tell you how grateful I am, and I'm sure our listeners are just gonna love it. Thank you, Hunter. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being on the same team. All right, buddy. And if you ever want to do it again, you know who to call. Just call me. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. okay, ciao.